afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the final presentation of the NMED that we've been holding this entire weekend for Aggies and Vent. We've been focused on 13 different need statements. We have 13 different teams that we're going to talk about today. And you are going to be up for a real treat. The teams have been working hard for the entire weekend. We started on Friday afternoon and we have continued throughout the rest of the weekend to really tackle 12 different need statements. We've had 69 students here involved in all of these various projects. I reminded the students on Friday afternoon that Sunday was about four, after, four hours from Friday afternoon. Most of the students didn't believe me now, then, but they believe me now because time passes so incredibly quick because of the innovation and the activity level that each one of our students have gone through. You're going to be treated to 10 minute presentations by each one of the teams. Inside the 10 minute presentations, they have, nine, they have a 90 second video to introduce their projects. This is a judging competition. The first place team will receive $1,000. The second place team will receive $750. This third place team will receive $500. But the main thing that we want you to know is, is that if you would like to continue your project, you would like to turn it into a startup, you'd like to turn it into a product, we want you as part of engineering entrepreneurship. And we will teach you and lead you through a startup process. We will teach you to learn how to go through and be sure that your product is absolutely the thing that needs to hit the market and will help you make it happen. We've had patents come out of this, we've had startups come out of it. So this is absolutely possible. So we want you to be part of our program. And I know many of you are from other universities and we welcome you here. We are so happy that you're here and we hope that the Texas heat has not wilted your spirit too badly. And I know our air conditioning isn't working perfectly in here, so we're trying, we're trying to work on that as well. It is warm. Thank you very much. I believe you're all amazed at what you've been able to accomplish in a very short period of time. I am amazed at what you've been able to accomplish in a very short period of time. I'm going to ask our judges to introduce themselves to you so that you get a chance to see who our judges are. And what will happen is you'll get 10 minutes, the timer's in the back. If it gets to zero, I will stand up and ask for questions. The judges will have five minutes to ask, ask questions uh, for you. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. After seven, we're going to take a short break. And then after that, we'll continue on. The judges will then retire to a deliberating room and we will choose the first, second, and third place team. Please understand that while this is a competition, all of you have gained tremendously and I've seen each one of you grow throughout the entire weekend. It has been my pleasure to watch you grow throughout the weekend. You've grown as individuals, you've grown as teams, you've grown and you have challenged yourself to do things that you didn't think you were capable of. We knew it and you responded to our expectations. Thank you very much. So let me let the judges, I'm gonna start with Dr. Hurtado, and I'll let him introduce himself very quickly, and then we're gonna start with the presentations. Hello, um, is it on? My name is Johnny Hurtado. I'm a professor here at uh, Texas A&M in um, aerospace engineering, and I'm an associate dean in the College of Engineering. I'm Jimmy Konetsky. Uh, I am from Dell EMC. I'm a system consultant. Uh, I have um, 22 years of experience at the university. Uh, and so they bring me back to uh, uh, learn a little bit more and that's what I'm here for. I'm Brett Trusco. I'm a professor here at A&M in the College of Medicine. Um, but uh, I do uh, big data analytics. And I've also got a doctorate in business. I've started seven businesses, sold three of them. So I know a little bit about starting up businesses. Hello, my name is Jose Flores. I am MD and I'm Associate Research Professor in College of Medicine and I have PhD in Health Informatics. Mm. I was helping some of you and helping with ideas, now I have to judge you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Clint Layseth. I was I'm a technical director at the Texas AM Center for Innovation and Advanced Development and Manufacturing over in the Health Science Center. And uh, my background is uh, I was a bench research scientist for 14 years and uh, uh, cell and molecular biology uh, protein engineering background. Thank you very much. All right, now, 
I'd like you also, um, so let's bring the first team up. I think it's pan pandemic. If y'all will come up and let's uh, get the presentation started. I'm Nicholas Straps. I'm also aerospace engineering here at Texas A&M. My name is Thomas McDonald. I'm a computer science major at Texas A&M. I'm James Moritis. I'm a linguistics major at Iowa State University. I'm Alex Jackson. I'm an electrical engineering student at California State University, Long Beach. During these past 48 hours of Aggie's invent, 156 Americans have died from opioid overdose. In 2015, 33,091 Americans died from opioid overdose. At 78 deaths a day, this is a death about every 18 minutes, the same time it took for you to watch your favorite TV show on Netflix. All walks of life can fall victim to addiction and dependence of prescribed and non-prescribed opioids. The opioid epidemic is sweeping America. What drives people to abuse opioids? Why do people become addicted and dependent on them? Why do doctors prescribe oxycodone, hydrocodone, and morphine? To ease pain. But pain is subjective. It's easy for a patient to say to their doctor, I need more, doc! I'm still at a six! And the doctor doesn't know if they're lying. They want them to be at a two out of ten, not a six out of ten. Our solution to this is to objectively quantify how much pain a patient is in. The Pandemic Scale. We will help prevent overdosing and underdosing by providing an intuitive and adaptive app that works on patient-specific needs. Each patient is different, and each solution should be dependent on them. Our app will help doctors by outputting a safe, effective, and non-addictive recommended dosage of painkillers. These headlines need to stop. Before we go into our solution, let us define pain. Pain is a nerve sending signal to the brain that they're in distress, that they're injured. And there are two types of pain. There's acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain, acute pain is short term. It's instant instantaneous or it can last up to six months. And examples of this are burns, cuts, post-operation. Chronic pain is long term, longer than six months. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain like arthritis, cancer, broken bones, back pain. And with this, doctors are prescribing 259 million prescriptions of opioids. You can see how this would lead to abuse, overdosage, black market sales, doctors selling them for extra cash. To stop this, we need an objective measure. So patients are saying, I need more. To solve this problem, yeah. how we measure pain, we have five design requirements. We want to measure pain quantitatively with mathematical formulas. We will include several biological responses such as heart rate to be calculated into a formula over time. This will help determine the quantity of medication a patient will need. We will have a set baseline for the vital requirement, for the vital measurements for a patient to have zero pain. So the way this is gonna work is we will have an app which will take a mathematical model based on five different measures of vital signs. One being electroencephalograms, specifically the amplitude and the coherence uh, of those waves. Heart rate, blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, and respiration rate. Um, these will then go into our model that we created, uh, and we'll get what we call the pandemic value. Now, keep in mind this value isn't on a one to 10 scale per se. 
it is a value that can technically be any value because it's based on the relative difference between a baseline value when the patient has zero pain and measurements taken at intervals after they start to feel pain. And this will be compared to the concentration of the medication in the patient's body based on the half-life of the drug. So to give a little example, say you're at a dentist and you're prescribed uh, hydrocodone for uh, the pain for removing your wisdom teeth. So as soon as you start feeling pain, your vitals start reacting in a way that it's called a, a natural bodily response that's called the, the fight or flight response. Now this response is natural and it's in every human being and we think it isolates the fact that you don't have to look at gender, age, or uh, any other discrepancy in medical treatment. Now here's an example response of our model as it's uh, over time and basically how the fight or flight response works. Um, next slide. So typically hydrocodone has a half-life of four hours and that's typically when people start saying that they're experiencing pain. So about four to six hours you're, you say it's starting to hurt, I'll take another dosage. But another dosage is another 10 milligrams could put you at even higher concentration than you're already at. As you can see here, when you start seeing that you're ha having pain, then your concentration is, is not zero. So you're gonna be adding even more concentration in your blood and it's unneeded. Next slide, please. So here's like a typical way our model can help doctors uh, prescribe medication over a period of time. And it's gonna be some, like a decaying amount of oral supplements. So it's, you'll take your first 10 milligram dose and based on when you experience pain, and we'll try to, the model like will go a little before that and give you a little less. So say you have a 10 milligram pill, then your next dose should be seven milligram and then five milligram until eventually you have no pain and no concentration of hydrocodone in your blood. Now, the best way our model can be uh, applied to the medical industry is if it was in patients that were uh, post-surgery, post so they have a constant IV, constant uh, measurement of their vital signs. So with constant measurement, we'll be able to predict when we need to constantly and consistently uh, like keep them sedated uh, with the hydrocodone so they don't feel pain. So <coughs> once we created our model, we had to find a method to deliver it to the hands of medical professionals. And so we had three ideas, mobile application, a standalone medical trolley that has the hardware and software necessary to give a correct dosage, and a wearable device that would also measure and give you an indication of the correct dosage. In the end, we decided on a mobile application for several reasons. One, it's easily spread worldwide, and it can work with existing technology in hospitals. Our application has two settings, an automatic recording mode and a manual recording mode. The automatic recording mode can connect to current devices that are in the hospital that are currently measuring blood pressure, heart rate, etc and automatically put that into our model to identify a correct dosage. However, in some places that might not be accessible or you won't have that ability, and so we have a manual recording mode so that you can manually put in those measurements so we can provide, put that into the model and provide a correct dosage. So a few things that if we had more time we would go into further research on is one, testing for the ideal weights of the biological measures going into our model. Because right now, uh, first, we don't know exactly what the measurements are and we did some research to find out what the weighting should be in our algorithm, but we want to do some further clinical trials to test, say, how heart rate responds to pain to get a better idea. We also want to test, uh, measure the amount of time a different drug concentration will stay in the body uh, compared to the concentration of a normal dose, like a 10 milligram or a 15 milligram uh, oral supplement. Also, we'd want to test whether small frequent doses can reduce the chance of addiction or the buildup of tolerance. And we want to compare how the BIS brain monitoring machine, uh, which is used for seeing how much anesthesia a patient needs can be integrated into our model to make it more accurate. Pandemic is unique in that we are taking ex existing measures of vital signs by doctors, putting into our formula to create an accurate dosage for what a patient needs. It's not subjective, it's objective. And we want to help stop the opioid, opioid epidemic. Americans are abusing and becoming addicted to this and moving onto harder drugs like heroin. But pandemic will play its part in ending opiate, opium addiction and substance abuse. We like to thank these people and acknowledge all the other mentors and staff who made this possible. Hey, Judge, you have five minutes.
minutes for questions. Sure, this is, a, this is very interesting. It would be a, a nice candidate for trying to get a research grant to actually, to actually work out the algorithm because it certainly makes a lot of sense. Of course, you know, there's a lot of variables that, um, that I don't understand, but did, or that you know, might, might vary, but you know, only by doing the research are you going to be able to do that. Um, did you find any research that had been done on this? And, and if so, was it like uh, along these formulas, or did you just kind of put this together based upon uh, a compilation? I that. So um, in, in our model right now, we kind of used um, the fight or fly response. Um, typically, that's just when your body goes into stress and either immediate pain or like you, you start realizing that something's not right. So what we did was we did research on um, like how that affects each part of our model. So like the heart rate and how that could change and how blood pressure and then also how those two are related. And we did things like that in order to kind of like weigh how much our model is going to um, increase with time in, 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 that, in that respect. And there was research done, like papers, journal articles, about how certain, uh, you know, heart rate, respiratory rate, how those are affected by pain. And so just based on those, we gave certain weights to them. But that's something we'd want to do further research on, is how specifically each is affected by pain and how we would want to compare them in our algorithm. I need research dollars. You can come see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go write up the grant application. <laughs> Any other questions? So is there a, a is there a baseline uh, to this? And then um, and so I see you nodding yes. And so I have my wisdom teeth pulled. So do we somehow uh, get a baseline measurement on me before that? And so so that would be the idea is that you want to get a baseline. The test would be getting the baseline. So you would have to subjectively beforehand measure how much pain a patient is in or how much so you can prescribe a dosage and the doctor would give a certain dosage of this medication and that would be when you get your baseline is when you're on the medication at zero pain and from there whenever the patient starts feeling pain we'll start taking incremental measurements for either a 10 or 20 minute time period which is about how long the fight or flight response usually lasts and then from there you can see when the curve of the pain intersects the pain or the, the curve for the half-life of how much is in the body and that's how you would determine how much the concentration is and then you can see what dosage you need to add after that. It's, it's on. It's not very loud. It's purposeful. All right. hmm. uh, did you have any cons consideration for uh, patients who might have chronic pain already on some sort of uh, painkiller uh, and then they have to go into uh, uh, surgeries or other uh, uh, trauma events where they need uh, additional uh, pain, pain management? Um, as far as uh, being on previous painkillers, we didn't take that into account. But as far as chronic pain, it, the idea is that if their heart rate or respiratory rate or anything like that is elevated when they're in pain, they would be given a small supplement of the drug to bring them down to a zero pain level. And then from there, that's where we take our baseline. And then once that drug begins to wear off, we could take measurements at those intervals on their pain to see Time for one more question. Okay, are you planning to use this within the hospital or the outpatient setting? Because that's not clear for me right now. Within the hospital. Within the hospital, yes, because if not, you are going to have right. a real big challenge with the E. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to be the. We were hoping limit. it would be medical professionals as well. Yeah. It would be hard to get the readings for anyone just using the app by themselves. Okay, thank you very much. The next theme is false reality.
I'm Ankit Ramchandani, a computer science major at Texas A&M University. Howdy, everybody. My name is Jonathan Mohern. I'm from University of Albany in New York. Howdy. My name is Henry Guerrero. I'm a math major at Texas A&M, and I'm a sophomore. Hey guys, my name is Frank Malambri. I'm an aerospace engineering major here at Texas A&M. I'm Adam Matthews, and I'm a uh, senior in computer engineering and Spanish at Iowa State University. that about one out of five patients in the hospital are infected by surgical infections. Did you know that more than one of three surgical patients acquire infections in the surgical room itself? A great number of infections are spread due to touching non-sterile computer devices like keyboards and mice. If a nurse does the same on behalf of the doctor, then problems of miscommunication and inefficiency arise. For example, 30% of procedure-specific information gets lost just in miscommunication. What if we could touch the lives of so many people by not touching? Well, we can. Introducing false reality. Now doctors and surgeons can themselves control all computer devices without touching. Yes, you heard it right. We've introduced a set of intuitive gestures after a survey done on doctors' preferences. Not only computers, surgeons can control their drills, their lights, the doors, and much more by just using gestures. This is our small step to solve the big need. Surgery. A, a sterile environment is needed to prevent, or at least help prevent, infection spread to and from the patient. And while operating, a surgeon may want to adjust the settings on his tools or the brightness in the room or, or manipulate an image on a screen or simply navigate a computer. And, to carry, and all these actions have the risk of, of contaminating the sterile environment. So our goal this weekend was to design tools that would allow the surgeons to carry out these actions without making any physical contact with them. And by eliminating the physical contact, we can greatly reduce the risk of contamination. So currently, nurses can be used to, to carry out these actions. However, it is not unheard of that a, a miscommunication can occur between the surgeon and the nurse. And not only that, if the surgeon can carry out these actions by himself, the operating room can be much more efficient, which can save time, which in turn save lives. So when looking for our solution, the first thing we looked at was things that have already been tested. The first thing we checked was the Hermes voice recognition technology. Now Hermes is very accurate and it, and it is smart enough to only detect the doctor's voice. The problem with this is it does not interface with um, our images like we wanted it to. It was also very expensive. Even to program the machine alone cost $120. So we looked at other things. The Kinect was another thing that was used made by Microsoft. It can be used to manipulate images and control a user interface. However, it is scope, its scope is too wide for us to consider it reliable. So we looked at things that weren't currently being used. The first thing we looked at was the Mayo. The Mayo is uh, an armrest that you put around your hand and it checks your hand movements. It comes built in with the keyboard, which we thought was very nice, but uh, the movements were not accurate, at least not accurate enough, and the keyboard was also not very fast. So we looked at, at the augmented reality from Microsoft. This was nice. It made the user interface the entire room, so you could pull up an image and put it somewhere and just hold it there <coughs> until you were ready. The biggest problem with this is that it was cumbersome, and we didn't want surgeons that were already had to wear a uh, a lamp on their head to have to wear virtual reality also. So we looked for solutions that both had user control and a keyboard that we could use quickly and efficiently. And our solution was? Um, so we basically consolidated and condensed everything into five specific design requirements. So our first design requirement involved our gesture keyboard to be contact free or intangible. Uh, specifically below the waist where a lot of surgeons are performing work and it's, it's non-sterile. 
So we wanted to see um, also if uh, our gesture keyboard could differentiate voice from commands. So in a highly dense populated area, we wanted to make sure that our specific keyboard would not pick up any minuscule, um, any, any just background noise that might interfere with the commands of, of our specific keyboard. Uh, thirdly, we want to make sure that our keyboard um, involves as little minimum training as possible in, in the sense that, for example, if you were to go into a hospital, you would notice that most of the nurses and most of the surgeons actually need to be prepped and primed before they actually engage and uh, finally use their, their devices. And they, they actually get that training specifically from uh, device and manufacturer representatives. And so we actually want to cut that out and we want to make it user friendly so that it would be uh, efficient and reliable. Our fourth design requirement involved it to be not obstructive. So you heard from Henry that our specific keyboard actually uh, doesn't involve any additional uh, wearable technology or anything that might over, over cast sort of the head so that it would be uncomfortable. So these surgeons are performing surgeries uh, designed for about I'd say minimum two hours, maximum it could, it could last a lot, a lot longer. And we want to make sure that they're not getting in the way and they're comfortable so that they feel more comfortable with whatever they're doing in, in the operation room. And our last design requirement involved um, our keyboard to read and interpret custom gestures. So we wanted to specifically uh, program specific gestures so that uh, our keyboard would uh, pick it up efficiently and reliably. All right, so now that we know the five requirements that our design was supposed to meet, here is our one solution that meets all five. We researched and found out that the most common need in an operation room is of the image MRI image viewer. And so we built it. But we built an MRI image viewer hands-free. You can watch it yourself. That's the leap motion device detecting hand motions and we are scrolling up and down on that MRI there. And this is gesture control. You can zoom in and zoom out by these gestures. And you can see these lights are detecting that. Uh, another important point was mentioned before, which was this, our design is not just making computers hands-free. We are taking it beyond. We are making it lights hands-free. You can change the intensity of lights without touching anything. You can open doors without touching anything. You can change the speed of the grill without touching anything. So it extends much beyond than just usage of computers. Now, when this idea becomes a product, we want to ensure that there are four fundamental factor, factors which go with it. First, it needs to be very intuitive. As was mentioned before again, we don't want doctors or nurses to receive prior training. And so we chose the gestures that were, that were uh, that were found from a study done on doctors themselves. We did not hard code these gestures. They recommended that in a study and we coded those gestures in the small program that you just saw running. Second, this needs to be viable. This looks like a very high tech solution, but let me tell you that the device we used to detect hand motion costs only $80. That is how cost effective this is and that is how practical it will be to use in a surgical environment. Third, we don't want this to be used only by the doctor himself. We want the, this to be used by everyone in the room, any nurse, anyone. Because again, this is very intuitive, right? We don't need any training for that. And that is why it is so easy to use. Fourthly and lastly, the a most a counter, counter argument was raised when we were making this design. And it was, if a doctor tells a nurse to type something, that will be very fast. If you use gesture based or voice commands, that is very slow. Well, as you saw in the first video, we found a way or an application which makes typing super fast, faster than a regular person can type on a computer. The goal of this project was to design and to demonstrate functionality and feasibility of a uh, means of interacting with a computer as to reduce the spread of bacteria in a non-sterile, uh, in a sterile environment. We have done this by uh, developing a product that is intuitive, non-intrusive, and requires no contact from the operators. 
removing one more non-sterile factor in an otherwise sterile environment. Thank you very much. Okay, judges, you have time for five for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. So the idea is then you could put this someplace central to the room so that different people in the suite yes. could step up and do it. So you could have a big screen and the doctor could say, somebody zoom that in, somebody could just walk over and do that or yes. that type of thing. Yeah. Right. And that is why it's not uh, obtrusive for the doctor. We, do, we don't want it to like obstruct in the functioning of the doctor. So it's just like right. such a small device as you saw in that video, which can be placed anywhere virtually. Does, that, have you, does it work like stuck on the wall? No. Okay. Not yet, and that is like one of just because the there's not a lot of flat surface available in this surgical suite, but yeah, I, yeah that, that would require a, the uh, the field to be limited, I suppose, and it is the field you can adjust the, the field of, of view, but there, that would so it's possible. It, it is yes. possible, right. yes. Like usually you don't have a, you don't you have, don't have obstacle if it's facing upward, but if it's facing right here or some if it's attached to the corner, you'll have obstacles then. It'll, So this was, I'll show you an image of this. This was a augmented reality um, supplement, basically. I mean, the, the doctor doesn't have to have this interfering with vision or anything. Right. It is not it's augmented not reality, right. exactly, because again, we are, we are using hand gestures to control it. So the doctor is not wearing any glass or something which is augmenting the reality, so to say. It is like, it, you are using this computer, we're moving to the next slide by a simple hand gesture simply a device that creates a space above it in which it is sensing hands. Okay, it's, it's another form of input to the computer. Yes, it's a right. input to the computer. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Specifically in a non-stereo. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, one more down here. Thank you. So, so your product is the software, the interface? Yes. Because the, the, the sensor was yeah, the existing hardware, that's the, hardware yes. the hardware is there we just need functions for it and we can we can make je custom gestures and pretty much customize it however we want okay. and the hardware usually is like interfaced with the computer what we did was like we control light switches as you were seeing in that video like mm -hmm. when my hand was moving left where the light was going on so that was to put it like a hardware perspective it's an internet of things it doesn't take very long to program the hardware is already there it's just our software that we built and it's definitely more versatile than just simply typing something. Uh, we, we added a few functions that would uh, differentiate it from what they use right now in the medical field. So what you're saying in the last 30 seconds here, that needs to be made much more clear during your presentation, okay? okay. Just in the future. Gotcha. Okay. okay, thank you all very much. <laughs> Next team is go, no go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. The worn off button is the cord. Yes, the worn off button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just did it. Are you still? Okay. Wait for the judges. <laughs> Chintapenta, and I'm an electrical junior, an electrical engineering junior. Hi, I'm Jackson Swilly. I am a civil engineering uh, student here at Texas A&M. I'm Pranjal Shukla, and I'm a mechanical engineering junior. I'm Sam Thomason. I'm a neuroscience uh, senior. Howdy, I'm Kevin. I am a uh, electrical engineering senior. Our sixth member of, of our team is Mackenzie Breeze, uh, who is a senior aerospace engineer. She was unfortunately unable to be uh, with us. But this is Go No Go.
In 2015 alone, 10,295 people were killed in drunk driving accidents. Sleepiness and mental fatigue can impair your cognitive faculties as much as intoxication. If you wouldn't drive drunk, why would you drive drowsy? At least 100,000 accidents per year are the direct result of driver fatigue. It's nearly impossible to judge your own level of impairment. GoNoGo -Go is an app that couples quantitative assessment of cognitive impairment with driver awareness monitoring to keep drivers safe on the road. This easy-to-use and research-driven test is based on the GoNoGo -Go paradigm, which has been used in cognitive neuroscience to assess mental faculties. If the test determines a driver to be cognitively impaired, it can send a message to an emergency contact, direct them towards an Uber or Lyft, advise the user to take a nap, or guide them towards the nearest coffee shop, basing recommendations on user impairment levels. For continuous monitoring, the phone can be mounted on the dash and its camera used to monitor a driver's awareness based on head movement, gaze, and blink tracking. Giving people a way to accurately assess their own cognitive impairment has the potential to save thousands of lives. How many of us have driven home at the end of a long day and felt even a little bit drowsy? How many of us have been jolted awake by uh, the sound of rumble strips on the side of a highway? The truth is, most of us. In fact, a study by the National Sleep Foundation found that at least one third of Americans have actually fallen asleep behind the wheel. The truth is that we're all susceptible to driver fatigue. The CDC reports that this problem is alarming. And indeed, one of the most alarming features about uh, fatigue driving is that you can't assess your own level of impairment. Now, there are many causes of impaired driving. Uh, the most salient among these being sleep deprivation, mental fatigue, and alcohol consumption. Now, the detrimental risks of alcohol consumption are well known. However, the uh, detrimental effects of sleep deprivation and mental fatigues, and indeed those dangers, are not quite as well known uh, amongst the general populace. However, uh, these can be just as dangerous. In fact, uh, there are studies across the board that relate uh, being awake for 24 hours to a blood alcohol content of 0.1%, which is above the legal limit. Uh, however, drivers are much more likely to get behind the wheel with, uh, after being awake for a day than they are, uh, say, being above the legal limit to, uh, uh, of intoxication, which makes this that much more of a, a big deal or an issue that we need to solve. We really like the idea of having an app and also integrated a lot of other components with it. Locking someone's car is a good way to prevent them from driving, but this seemed too invasive to have our initial design based on it. A physical game seemed impractical and not marketable. Uh, research showed that melatonin was not a sufficient indicator of um, drowsiness. Continuous monitoring, however, showed to be really effective due to the effects of long drives and sleep, um, sleeping on the highway. We faced a lot of challenges during this project. Some of these were that it was difficult to measure both drunk driving and drowsy driving together. We wanted to have a test that would not be invasive, in, invasive to the population. We wanted, also wanted to base our project on a lot of research. Our app design employs a cognitive test that is based on over a century of neuroscience research and um, combines that with continuous or the option for continuous monitoring to keep um, drivers aware and awake while behind the wheel. Um, the go-no-go -no -go paradigm is a commonly used neuroscience task to assess cognitive function um, and the task involves a participant making a choice between responding or not responding when they are shown a stimulus. For instance, with our task that we designed, we have a circle and a square. And whenever you are presented a circle, you are supposed to tap on the screen as fast as possible. But if you see a square, you are supposed to not tap on the screen. This task becomes much more difficult when there are proportionally more circles than squares on the screen because the impulse becomes to tap any stimulus that appears. And so, Research over the last 
100 years has shown that performance, um, that is reaction time and response accuracy decreases with alcohol use, sleep deprivation, and just plain mental fatigue. Um, so here, er, and that data is uh, corroborated by EEG and functional magnetic resonance imaging. So here is um, a little example of how the app works. You start the test, it gives you instructions, it says to click on the circles but not on the squares. So you start the game and you're immediately shown a stimulus and you have to touch it as fast as possible. And then another one, and then if you see a square, you have to inhibit your response to touch it. And then if you don't touch it, you're correct. At the end of the test, it shows you your results and gives you recommendations based on its assessment of your level of impairment. The autonomic nervous system has been shown to become less active as a person becomes um, sleepy or drowsy. This, uh, this um, activity has also been correlated to heart rate. Because of this fact, we can use heart rate to act accurately detect when an individual is at risk of falling asleep. Um, it is important to note, though, when measuring heart rate variability, that you need to establish an individual baseline because heart rates vary um, amongst different individuals. So for facial recognition, you're able to track a number of behaviors um, of, I guess, impaired or possibly impaired drivers. The first is that your blink frequency increases as you become um, drowsy, and the velocity of your eyelids during these blinks actually slows down. The um, percent closure of your eyes increases because the eyelids begin to sag with drowsiness. This is also a symptom of intoxication. Gaze nystagmus is the inability to smoothly follow movement with the eyes, and this can also be measured with um, gaze tracking. Posture and head nodding are great um, ways to measure uh, the level of impairment of a driver, or at least detect possible impairment, because they're easy to detect even with low quality cameras. So the eye tracking works by identifying the boundary of the eye socket. And it uh, measures the contrast of your eye color with your face. It encases the socket in a square, and when you turn your head, one eye looks smaller to the camera than the other. Now by determining, comparing the size of those squares, you can determine the direction of gaze of the person. When you blink, the square disappears. And if the eye is closed for a prolonged period of time, we can understand that a person is drowsy. Now the, to implement this model, the technology does exist. There are open source codes on GitHub, which can directly give you output of the lag time and of the direction of gaze. You just need to integrate into, it into a software. So why go no go? It's user friendly, it's non-invasive, it's backed by over a century of research, and it's no rocket science. It's comprehensive. Market event. Our market is basically everyone on the road. But these are some of our major markets. Transport corporations, medical facilities, a military would like to use it to ensure that their employers are safe on the road, to show that they care for their people. Parents would like to use it, parents would like their children to use it to be assured of their safety on the road. Insurance companies might give you incentives to use it because they pay for the accidents. We plan to integrate it with a smartwatch which can measure your heartbeat, it can have the go no go test, and it can take the data from a dashboard camera and combine all these data to tell whether you are impaired or not and can wake you up or warn you by making vibrations or sounds. Go no Go is an exciting opportunity by combining research-based cognitive testing and continuous monitoring to solve the problem of impaired driving. With, uh, with tremendous opportunity of expansion and development, with Go no Go, we can save lives. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks. 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 Okay, judges, you got five minutes. So looking at this application, um, it looked like there were two sections. Yep. There was a, a, a visual uh, gaze, and then there was a uh, cognitive uh, pushing the button. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the demonstration didn't show how they related to one another, so we were trying to figure out that. Yeah. How the um, how the test and the monitoring relate yeah. to each other? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you get into the before getting into the car or get behind the wheel, it it asks you to. Sorry. It asks you to test, take the test, the cognitive test. 
the eye tracking and all the stuff that is while you are driving it is there's a camera on the dashboard which is continuously monitoring it like if you drowse like that that's track your eyes your eyes are closed for a prolonged period and it, it, there's a watch there which vibrates or makes a sound and lets you know that you are feeling drowsy okay you might have said so the reason for the continuous monitoring after taking the test is in case you get behind the wheel and at that point you're fine but after a couple hours of driving you do become drowsy mm -hmm. Just because of road hypnosis and just... And the recommendations, also we've got a yellow section in the middle between green and red, right? So the yellow section is more meant for, um, you might be good to drive, but just to make sure you might want to set up continuous monitoring, which is kind of that suggestion. So. Uh, I had another question. I noticed y'all had some marketing, um, some targets there. Uh, was there any consideration for uh, using some sort of incentive through marketing to have yeah. people use this? Yeah. Actually, we were, uh, there's already such plans existing in insurance market. Like, if you maintain a very good health, the, insur the health insurance company makes, you, makes it half for you. That if you maintain a good health, we'll give you health insurance for half the price. So the car insurance company and health insurance companies can give you incentive that if you use this app and go abide by it, we'll give you a discount on the insurance. For your coffee from Starbucks. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Marketing, yeah. To also do Uber and Lyft as well. Yes, as well. How unique is, is this solution? Uh, in the terms of its comprehensiveness, it's pretty much the only one, uh, well, it's the only one on the market that com kind of combines uh, the idea of testing before you get in the car and um, continuous monitoring. There is another app that had you play a game to assess your, um, your impairment like this, but the game was not as research-backed. It was like a, some memory kind of game. Um, and it was also not coupled with the potential for continuous monitoring while you're in the car. And when we came in the morning, we took the test and we all failed. While we are not impaired, so it doesn't work properly. <laughs> so what was monitoring the eyes, the gaze? The, um, uh, there's a camera on the dashboard which takes a video. A simple, it can be a simple mobile front camera. Okay. It works. It, it doesn't need to be some fancy stuff. It just takes a video and there are open source course, course, course on the GitHub which can track your eyes. Okay. Not a, Something very difficult. Okay. I think there's time for one more question if you have one. Okay, good enough. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next team is FYI. My name is Andy Pimentel. I'm a mechanical engineer from West Texas A&M University. Hi, my name is Alexandra Heinemann. I'm an aerospace engineer from Texas A&M. Hi, I'm Tim Overby, and I'm a mechanical engineer from the University of Illinois. Hi, I'm Carlos. I'm a systems engineer from Texas A&M International. We are Team FYI, and our project is the Portable Diagnostics Kit. Thomas Powers was a newlywed expectant father. He and his wife had just finished construction of their new family home. Their future was looking bright and full of life. But on June 20th, 2017, he began to experience chest pains and an ambulance was dispatched. The responding EMTs believed his condition was non-critical. The EMTs opted to take him to a hospital that was further away. Thomas passed away in the ambulance en route to the hospital. Without an EKG, the EMTs were not able to properly diagnose the cause of his cardiac distress, a block valve that needed a stent. 
If the EMTs knew the seriousness of his case, he could have made it to the nearest hospital and have lived to hold his newborn child. Instead, his child will never know him, all because of a misdiagnosis easily prevented by an EKG. Current medical equipment for first responders is inadequate in these situations. The devices are often too large to efficiently bring into the field. Additionally, information gathered in the field is often unavailable for use almost immediately after it is gathered. This leads to precious time wasted as information is transferred to EMTs to doctors. The FYI is an all-in-one solution that combines the medical technologies of an electrocardiogram, a pulse oximeter, and a stethoscope. From a device roughly the size of a book, a first responder will be able to take and read EKGs, blood oxygen levels, and record stethoscope data. This information can then be streamed directly to the hospital to allow for proper ER preparation. From regular EMT operations to disaster zones and battlefields, this device will allow for faster, more efficient, and more accurate diagnosis of injured patients. This leads to faster and better informed decisions made in the field, allowing precious lives to be saved. quick overview of what we're going to be uh, discussing today. First, we're going to talk about why this is actually something that we should look further into. Why do we need this? Then we'll go into the problem statement. We'll discuss some of our initial ideas. Um, then we'll get into our final design, stating what our goals were, uh, what the user interface looks like, what components and electronics were used. Then into future modifications that if we had the time and uh, money that we could uh, make to make this device uh, more um, applicable. And then we'll finally have our conclusion. So as uh, showed in the video, right now uh, for communicating from the EMTs to the ER, the ER doesn't actually receive much information. They may receive some very, very basic information saying like maybe a name, an age, um, they were, um, I don't know, a car crash victim or um, something just very basic, nothing, nothing specific so the ER can't actually properly prepare for, to receive these patients and have the correct treatment already set up for them. Um, there also is the possibility of miscommunication of information. If there are multiple victims in a crash or uh, there's a large disaster, it's easy to get little bits of information mixed up, which could lead to a larger problem down the road. Um, there's also the possibility of bad diagnosis in the field, like the case of Thomas Powers, um, where the, the EMTs just don't have the proper equipment to get a full diagnosis. They could miss something small that would show up with the, the good stethoscope or with the pulse, uh, pulse oximeter, the EKG that can actually be treated now. And the, as it showed in the video, a lot of this equipment is large or just awkward shapes, so it's hard for them to take into the field into hard to reach areas to help um, those people. So our goal was to create a device that combined a stethoscope, a pulse oximeter, and an EKG and electrocardio, uh, electrocardio di uh, electrocardiogram excuse me, um, into one small portable device so it can be easily carried. Um, at this point, we had not narrowed it down to EMT, so it could be carried by a concerned mom or used in a pediatrics ward. Um, it needed to be able to record this information and then be able to send the information wirelessly to some sort of device, be it a phone, a tablet, or, or another computer. So now we're going to look at a couple of ideas on how to implement these requirements into a device. The first idea we had was to design a small device primarily for pediatric use, whether within a pediatric ward itself or on home visits. We wanted it to be small and child friendly so as to not you know, have the scary nature that most medical equipment has. Um, also, it would have all the information you need on the device itself, a display, keyboard, everything could be accessed from there, and then you could save the data to review it later or transmit it to a central server or something. Our second idea is what we like to call the paranoid mom, primarily designed by, for in-home use by non-medical people. It would allow you to um, you know, monitor your child, and if it detected anything that was abnormal, it could alert um, alert you to call a doctor and then transmit the data that it had recorded to the doctor so they have a head start on figuring out a treatment. Our thoughts from this one is it doesn't need the full interface on the device itself, rather it could pair with a smartphone or a tablet. The third design we had, which is what we wound up going with, is uh, set up more for EMT and field use. It would be used by first responders. We wanted it to have pretty much the similar, all the same capabilities but everything on the device, but much more durable. Um, and of course, give accurate readings and quick readings in the field. A couple other things we'd like to say about it. Yeah. We wanted there to be this three diagnostic tools we mentioned earlier in the device. 
It would have, of course, the screen on it. You can see on our prototype, we've got a bit of the screen here. It has all the number pads, large buttons so it can be operated even with gloves. You have number pad here, arrow keys. You can enter, go back. And by using the method shown on the screen, you can still enter text using that. This allows us to reduce the size that would be necessary for a full keyboard while still maintaining most of the functionality. Additionally, we'd be able to save information for multiple patients on here and then send that information ahead to the hospital either in, uh, so they can prep the emergency room for our particular case or if I am in the field and I just have basic training in using this but don't necessarily know how to interpret the results, an off-site doctor can advise me on the proper course of action. Okay, for the user interface, uh, we didn't want to make anything like too complex. Like, uh, they connect the machine and they get a quick reading. So when you click on diagnostics, you get three options. You get the EKG, the digital stethoscope, or the pulse oximeter. Um, as, your, as the EMT is uh, connecting and checking everything on the patient, it's transmitting data to the hospital, the doctor sees it, he can better diagnose to see if, uh, if like, this is the correct hospital for him or does he have to go somewhere else, this may be a more severe uh, case. For components on this, uh, it was two, we just used two adrenals for the multiple sensors that connect to a Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi transmits all the data to the hospital and to the EMT. For, through various channels, which could be um, not necessarily Wi-Fi, it could be 4G, it could be a satellite, it could be uh, various different options, depending on what's available on the field. Future modifications for this device include the implementation of retractable cables to reduce the risk of the cables um, tangling up and having to waste time untangling them, a larger screen for easual, easier visualization of the data, an improved user interface just for improved um, intuitiveness to the product, um, higher quality medical equipment in order to provide more accurate readings, and waterproofing as well as a harder case shell to protect it from any damages that may occur out in the field. <coughs> Through the use of our design, <coughs> hospitals can become better prepared by having the EMTs transmit data directly to the hospitals. This would allow them to prepare the emergency rooms with the equipment that they need to treat the types of wounds that they are going to be dealing with. It is space saving, which will allow the EMTs to travel with um, different types of equipment, uh, supplies, anything they might need in the field. It's portable, so if it's needed some, in some disaster area, in the middle of a disaster area, a battlefield, anywhere, it can be taken there and can be implemented. And through the use of improved communication lines, patient um, treatment will be improved. Overall, I'll, our device will save lives. Cool. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Judges, five minutes. Your third market that might be the best market is third world countries mm -hmm. where you have people without medical training that are going to need to do checkups for kids and moms and dads and other patients. Regarding that, I have a big concern. Are you aware of whale challenge propac? A what? Whale challenge propac? No. Then this is a device that exists in the market for. I don't know, perhaps seven, eight years. It's compact, designed for EMPs, and we, are be, we have been using that in developing countries for for long time ago, then that's a big concern for me. Yes, because regarding the innovation of, of the integration, actually they are in the market devices that work in that way. Uh, and actually, the prop pack is, you can carry that basically in your, in a kangaroo, uh, back and, and basically deploy the thing on the, on the field. It has Wi-Fi, then you have a Wi-Fi in the ambulance, then you can have a network there and to, to do things like that in the in the, in the the field. Then, yes, I just wanted to, yes, sometimes it's different, it's difficult to look into the, into the, the market, but there are solutions that are quite similar to this. I'm asking because I would like to know what is different with that type of solution that is uh, out there. That's what I was asking if you are aware of the PROPA and how this differentiates with that type of device. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite aware of all the, the characteristics of that device. Um, in our research, we never we never saw you that. Know, that's why I'm asking yeah. if you can yeah. find it because no, no, we weren't you can, it's easy to miss. Then yeah. 
so along those same lines, I, I carry a phone in my pocket that can do two of those three things already. Um, was there any consideration of using existing mobile technology that allows add-ons for the EKG, something more detailed, something that could just simply plug in, use an app that's already pre-approved to send to the hospital? Uh, you know, and, and I'm thinking of rural areas where they don't have access to some of this uh, equipment. That's good, but one of the problems you get with anything mobile-based is if, if it's using sensors integrated into the phone, they're not necessarily designed for this, nor are they able to give you results that are the quality you might need. So while well, that's certainly good in a lot of cases, it might not always be what you might need better equipment. For. And what's written in our protocol is that if it can't send the information automatically to the, the chosen hospital, it will keep trying in a set interval until it reaches um, the proper um, connection strength to be actually able to transmit that information. Okay. Any other questions, judges? Okay, thank you very much. The uh, next team is Team Bankers. Oh, sorry, sorry. What's your presentation? Oh, sorry. Be careful with the mouth. It's already just Team Bankers, right? <laughs> Everybody ready? Okay, take it away. Thank you. Uh, so, howdy. We are Team Bakers, and we're here to talk to you, talk to you about the Premi Scope. Uh, so, my name is Pablo Leon. I'm a junior mechanical engineering major here at Texas A&M University. I'm Zach Davis. I'm a senior in material science and engineering at North Carolina State University. Howdy. My name is Antara Gupta. I'm a junior chemical engineering major here at Texas A&M. Go ahead. My name is Rachel Cohen, and I am a chemical engineering major at Montana State University. Cannon Woodbury. I got my bachelor's in biomedical engineering at UT Dallas, and I'm here at A&M studying medicine and engineering. Hello, my name is Cassie Marble, and I'm from Charleston State University, and I'm majoring in physics. So first, we're going to show a fun video from Zach Davis. Premature babies are at risk for detached retinas. 28,000 babies are born each year with the chance of having retinopathy. 14,000 to 16,000 will be affected by this disease. Of these, 1,100 to 1,500 will need a medical procedure. The Premi Scope can prevent this. The current method is using an indirect ophthalmoscope, which is harsh to the child, requires expensive equipment, takes multiple people with high levels of training, and the results are hand-drawn by the physician, which means the accuracy and clarity are dependent on the doctor's artistic capabilities. The Premi scope is easy on the baby with a pacifier and distractions to keep it calm and occupied during the screening. It is cheap to manufacture, can be performed by a single nurse, and takes digital images which can be quickly sent to the doctor for analysis 
and provide clarity without relying on artistic skills, leaving results easy to read and babies happy with a brighter future. So first, a little bit more background information about retinopathy, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, which is what this would be used for. So uh, this disease occurs in uh, low birth weight premature infants. So those are born either 32 week, uh, before 32 weeks of gestation or under 1,500 grams, which is about three pounds. So if you can imagine a three pound baby, uh, they're very fragile. Uh, you need to make sure that everything you use is very safe and quick because you can't really tell them what to do yet. Um, and we want to make sure, of course, that they're safe and getting the best treatment they can. And so what happens uh, is uh, since, they, uh, since these babies are born before they're ready to, uh, their veins are underdeveloped. And when these underdeveloped veins try to grow, uh, they can swell and they can overlap, which can uh, cause the retina to detach which leads to, can lead to blindness or other problems. So there are two main techniques to solve retinopathy. There's indirect, which requires a extensive training from the physician because they wear a headset and the use of the eyelid speculum. Also, this, Im this technique also produces an inverted image while also producing decreased magnification. Direct retinopathy techniques um, produce a discomfort on the patient because of the long-lasting uh, flash or light that's over the patient's eyes. And it also does not produce a digital image because now uh, doctors have to draw out what they are seeing and base it off of their interpretations. Texas Children's Hospital came, released a need statement that wants to eliminate the need of indirect ophthalmoscopy and the use of the eyelid speculum and allows for a rapid examination, and PremiScope attempts to tackle this need statement. Thanks, Preeta. So after a careful consideration of, these, uh, of this problem, we arrived at five requirements for a design that would successfully solve this problem. And uh, the first of those requirements is that it's safe for use on premature babies. The second requirement is that it's small and agile because in the neonatal intensive care unit, it can be crowded and it can be busy, so it needs to be able to be useful in that environment. We want to be able to ret visualize the retina without the use of the metal uh, eyelid speculum. So we looked at a study that basically compared the eyelid speculum versus bimanual retraction of the eye. And in that study, it showed that bimanual retraction was uh, by far more comfortable than the metal speculum. We also wanted to be able to acquire the image in under 30 seconds and, use, and have it be a handheld and portable device. So we went through a few designs. We looked at a approach that used a mobile type device that hung above the baby and could visualize straight down. We looked at another device that might clip on the side of the bassinet and peer inside. We finally arrived on a design that is a handheld device that you slip your phone into and uh, you're able to visualize the retina that way. So it, we removed the need for the eyelid speculum by using this neat little trick uh, using the, the sucking, suckling reflex. So we talked to a physician when we first started this project and he mentioned this suckling reflex where when a baby has something placed in its mouth it'll naturally open its eyes. And you'll see how we use this later on. We also modernized the procedure by using a smartphone and we reduced the cost of the procedure by both reducing the time and reducing the amount of personnel needed to perform this procedure. So without further ado, here's our design. <laughs> this right here, uh, well, we'll go through it piece by piece. So we've got the ergonomic handle uh, that allows for comfortable use and stability. We have a trigger right here which fires the shutter of the camera. This allows for quick capture as well as a stable image. Uh, moving on, you can see we have a battery-powered LED here with variable power, which allows us to light up the retina and make it easier to sight and uh, acquire the image. We have an acrylic box that can hold almost every phone. It fit all the phones on our team. And uh, we also have a telescoping boom here with the lens and the pacifier. The lens that would be used um, is called a uh, um, fundus lens. Uh, we didn't have a fundus lens, so we ended up using a um, 
condensing lens from an Olympus Tokyo microscope. So does this meet all the requirements? Uh, we believe it does. It's handheld, portable, it's inexpensive, made with acrylic, 3D printing, and some uh, epoxy batteries. It's easy to use, can be used by nurses or physician's assistants, and with the phone, having a digital copy of the fundus image is awesome. You're able to store that image and look at it over time, and you're also able to send it to experts anywhere in the world. So if you guys like to pass this around, go ahead and check it out. Thank you, Cannon. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about the ergonomic handle. Um, we really designed it so that you can do it use it one-handed and so that you can still get a stable image because your hand is not slipping in any way. Um, so it was actually formed using a clay model and then scanned that way. Um, so obviously the question is why is our model any better than anything that's out there? Because um, they do have like small little devices. But the, the reason is, is that ours is fast. Um, you only have to have it for a moment to get the picture and then you can move on. Um, also, we don't need to use the eyelid speculum. We can use the pacifier and the baby will open its eyes. As well as, because you have that digital image, you can use applications for like third world countries where they might have a smartphone but they can't pay for that fancy camera that most people have. Um, and you also don't have to worry about drawing out the image and making sure that it's a perfect representation because you can send it off. Now, we'd actually like to change our lens out with a fundus lens and perform these images once again to make sure it's actually working and to make further modifications to it to make sure that it will work. Besides that, we want to go to a NICU, CD type of environment first um, in person and make modifications to our device based off of what we see and what advice the nurses could possibly give us there. Besides that, we already have a couple of modifications we want to make. For instance, if you take a look at the, the mount for the lens, we want to make sure that, one, it will slide on easily so that if a nurse is using it, they wouldn't have so much trouble. And also, we want to change the screws to a way that you can do fine tuning so you don't have to have a hard time moving this uh, mount. We'd like to say thank you to everybody who helped us at Aggies Invent, especially the mentors, and special thanks to Dr. Raju, Dr. Cohen, and Dr. San Andres for their medical expertise. Thank you very much. Time for questions. When I telescope out, does that carry the, the lens and the pacifier? They, they both go out together? Is that correct? They, not on this prototype, but that is right, the idea. Right, that would be no, the idea. That's the idea. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I've seen people do this. It's quite an, actually an elegant solution, so uh, I, 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 congratulations. It's, it looks good. The pacifier, I assume, you know, would just be an exchangeable <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'd also um, like to improve it to a sweetie, I think they're called. Um, they carry sugar water, mm -hmm. and so that uh, calms the baby even more than just simply suckling. We also would probably want to adjust the position so that we can encompass different size heads for the babies, because you don't want to actually stick it on their eye or near their eye. You actually want it to go in their mouth. I would also recommend being someone who's left-handed, uh, a left-handed model. <laughs> if you're going to go ergonomic, there are 10% of us out there who can't use the right-handed model. Um, be sure uh, to have the capability of, beef, uh, of focusing. Yes. Because what you mentioned uh, with the screws and everything. The pictures incorporated, the eye picture, is actually what we took of Mr. Rodney. And um, once, we get the, once we replace the lens, it can actually go into the retina. It was quite comfortable. <laughs> did you use this? <laughs> no, I <laughs> did not use the pacifier. We <laughs> the pacifier. Just, the just to be clear, this was a picture that was taken with that device. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, no, that was Charlie. Sorry. No, this yeah, was, was Charlie, Charlie. Sorry. sorry. The one in the one video one. was Mr. Yeah, yeah. 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 I and <laughs> yeah, the one in the video, um, you can actually see a shadow of the retina, um, even with the, the lens we have. So. Thank you, Mr. Rodney and Charlie. It's, so this device, you, you, you'll still have to dilate the eye to get the pupil wide enough to get a, a uh, an image, or? To be honest, we're not sure. We actually have to do the test. We have to change up with change the up a fundus lens, take tests, and then make the modifications as we go. There's a lot of tricky optics that comes into play. Well, then I can imagine on a premature baby, the you know, a non-dilated eye, that pupil is probably pretty small. Pretty small. But what we're trying to eliminate is the numbing serum that they also have. So even if we do have to dilate the eyes, right now procedures have a numbing serum? Oh, for the speculum. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next team is Team uh, TBI. Okay, take it away. Hello, we are TBI Solutions, and today we'll be presenting on Trauma Alert. I'm a civil engineering major at California State University, Sacramento. I am Francisco Medrano. I am an aerospace engineering student at Texas A&M University. My name is Jordan Murley, and I'm a physics student at Rice University. I'm Katie Oswald. I'm from the University of Colorado in Boulder, and my major is chemical and biological engineering. The hometown football star knocked to the ground in a brutal tackle. A mother caught in an accident while driving kids to school. The hero thrown to the side as a landmine explodes. Traumatic brain injury, or TBI, can happen to anyone. TBI is difficult to diagnose because it has few visible symptoms, such as bruises or broken bones. Even hospital MRI or CT scans can fail to recognize TBI. Trauma Alert is the first handheld device which warns users of the seriousness of a head injury based on blood levels of BDNF. A drop of blood is placed on a disposable chip which is inserted into the device. The simple interface guides users in high stress situations. Test results are displayed in less than 10 minutes Data storage allows long-term monitoring. By moving TBI detection from the hospital to the place of injury, Trauma Alert prompts users to seek care when necessary. The star player graduates with honors, the independent mother watches her children grow, and the brave soldier enjoys a warm homecoming. We were tasked with creating a handheld uh, device that would test for TBI or traumatic brain injuries. And we were to do this uh, by detecting levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. This is a protein that naturally occurs in the uh, bloodstream, and it, it's present in, uh, in normal day circumstances. But during uh, events of brain trauma, the levels decrease. Here we have a graph where the black line up top shows the average uh, BDNF levels for just everyday experience when everyone normally has. And the blood bars at the bottom are measured uh, BDNF levels across about a week of a 
right after a brain trauma. And as you can see, even at day zero, the very first bar, there's a significant decrease that's very measurable in concentration, and it continues throughout the entire week and up to the six months. Stemming from these requirements, um, stemming from this need statement, we had a set of five requirements. First off, we wanted quick results. Not everyone has access to a care facility, such as a hospital. Second of all, we wanted this to be minimally invasive, steering away from the typical MRI scan, CT scan, um, something that's minimally invasive, similar to a blood pressure monitor or diabetes monitor. Third of all, user-friendly. We're looking at users which would not have previous exposure to this device. We want them to have a very simple experience, very straightforward. Fourth of all, we want this to be portable. Like I mentioned before, moving this away from the hospital to the point of care, place of injury, we need this to be able to be carried on the field, wherever it is. And lastly, we need data storage capabilities. So not only we can um, diagnose or indicate TBI risk, but we can also have providers look at this information later on and access it in an accessible manner. Some of the current techniques to measure if you have a brain injury include uh, to the subject telling if they have had a brain injury, MRI or CT scans, and BDNF monitoring which, uh, with bulky equipment, such as this one pictured in the, uh, on the right. This can't be taken on the field, it can't be taken uh, to a football stadium, and it can't be taken home to, for continuous monitoring. But we, what we decided to do was create trauma alerts, a combination of existing technology, which is a compact device. Some of the ideas that we considered were resistance of the blood or ELISA assays, which are used generally in a lot of different applications. We also considered fret analysis, but we decided against these methods because they're either not sensitive enough or they're too complicated to compact down into a handheld device. So I'm going to go through the um, process that we decided. It's known as immunoaffinity um, capillary electrophoresis. You'll place the blood sample on the well and it'll travel through the capillary and the protein of interest will attach to antibodies attached to the side of the capillary. The antibodies are super specific for the specific um, protein, so you'll only capture what your target protein is. Next, you'll run a buffer that contains a dye, and the dye will attach itself to the protein of interest. The dye will then fluoresce once it's exposed to a laser, and that will allow the device to detect the concentration of the protein in the blood. This is done by using another buffer that runs through and detaches the protein from the antibodies. As it moves down the capillary, it'll pass through the laser beam and it will emit a wavelength. From the side view, you can see that the lens in the photo detector are orthogonal to the laser and this will allow only the emitted light from the uh, dye molecule to be detected and that will be transmitted to a micro microcontroller to further analyze the results. The following video shows an example of uh, this device, at least of the uh, photoresistor. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, once uh, oh well, um, oh, uh, here uh, with differing intensities of light, it can determine if uh, there is a high intensity or low intensity, and tell the uh, tell the person if they need to go to a hospital. And so once we go from there, we'll, it'll display everything on a simple to use inter, uh, graphic interface looking like this. It's very straightforward, very uh, simple, not many things to press. You literally just hit begin and it'll prompt you and walk you through whatever steps you need to take, including adding the blood drop to whatever sample well and it'll indicate which one. There are various pull tabs that you'd have to pull to let the proper blood solutions pull out at the right time. It'll walk you through that. And then it'll tell you to insert the chip into the bottom of the device, and it'll tell you how it'll measure however long you need to wait in order for the proper thing to go through. And by the end of 10 minutes within that time, it'll eventually tell you, it'll give you the result, either telling you that you're at high risk of TBI, at moderate risk, 
or at a low risk with a corresponding color code along with it. How would we implement this in a commercially available device? So, one of the benefits of our device is the fact that we combine various technologies that are already out there. They're already working towards mass production, and we make it into one device that can be taken anywhere that it needs to go. The technology has been proven to work already, and so all we would need to do is to start up production. Some of our potential future uses such as the video uh, described, would include first responders and military personnel. Second of all, maybe every high school football team. Maybe something that they should have by the end of the night to know whether to start uh, one of their players who has been injured on a, a concussion treatment plan. And finally, it can, be, it can allow continuous monitoring at home. So, the versatility of this device lies in the fact that right now we're scanning for BDNF. Later on, once this device is mass produced, we can look for other proteins. This will allow us to check for many different symptoms, many different uh, illnesses, and potentially make breakthroughs in diagnosing those conditions on site as well. Like I said, Equipment would be the same. The only difference would be the antibody that is in these individual wells. The same procedure would be followed. So Thank if you. you have any questions, we are happy to answer. And we had quite a significant body of uh, work that we would like to also cite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are the antibodies already available? Yes. So um, there, this has been tested in a much larger scale. They've done the ice with um, BDNF protein, and so there are antibodies available. Um, they would just, it would just require us to modify the capillary tubes with the specific antibodies. <coughs> so if I can add on, the way that it is innovative is the fact that in privacy, Previous applications, this lab on a chip has been used for regular capillary electrophoresis. Whereas we, as far as we know, we would be the first to use immunoaffinity capillary electrophoresis on this lab on a chip device. So in that case, we think our device is a very innovative product that we can bring to the market. Does the detection of BDNF, is it, the, the, uh, I guess, the change after uh, a head injury quick enough to have something detected quickly? Does it, does it fall off very rapidly? Or Within something like this? Two hours after two hours. an injury. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you never know the value before. Then you, actually, you need to take at least two measurements to know that things is going down. Baseline for all humans. Okay. There it is. So, uh, Oh, go ahead. No. Uh, in the uh, first graph that uh, you had seen with the bar chart, uh, you had seen that it was uh, about 60 uh, milligrams, no, nanograms per milliliter, mm -hmm. and then it had dropped below the error for uh, the population that they had tested. Yeah, to give you an idea of the values you're looking at, it, the average population is about 60 nanograms per milliliter, and a moderate uh, head injury, it drops to about 20 milligrams per mil nanograms per milliliter. And in the more severe ones, where you need to seek medical attention, it's down to four. And so it would be smart to test immediately after, but even if you can't get that through, you can still get a very good idea of the range. In those studies of dropping, did they report the Glasgow Coma score that is related with that dropping? I'm asking because that's a clinical indicator of, of how, how severe is the injury. And it would be interesting if the Glasgow uh, Glasgow Coma score was above 13. That's basically somebody that is normal, and the thing is dropping. That's where this has really importance. Because somebody that has a Glasgow Coma score between 9 and 13 is going to be in the hospital, and it's below 9 is going to be in the ICU. Then it's not practical for them. But for those that are above 13, those are the ones that actually one want to look. 
one of the papers did mention the Glasgow score. Uh, we can definitely bring that up for you. Yeah, because that's the perhaps looking into that yeah. would be the, the, the tipping point for for actually application. Mm -hmm. um, the way it would alert the user, we would set the um, the uh, brightness of the fluorescence. It would depend on the concentration, and we would. Uh, relate that to probably the Glasgow score as well. Yeah, I would say if you want to check this out and do further research, definitely the DOD's got money, but uh, other people like school systems probably don't yet. <laughs> right. There's time for one more question if you have any. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. presentation is by Operation X. Howdy. 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 All right. <laughs> I'll say it again no, sometime. In a, minute, in a minute, in a minute. Okay, now. Okay. <clears throat> Howdy. Hi. Thank you. My name is Stefan Manoharan. Um, I'm elect electrical engineering class of 2018. I'm Ganatma. I'm a junior in mechanical engineering from IIT Tirupati. Hi everyone. I'm Sudiksha Bandari. I'm a senior mechanical engineering student at Texas A&M University. Hello. My name is Jacob. I'm a mechanical engineering student from West Texas A&M. And today we'll be talking about our product, OPEX. In the modern world of medicine, there are many realities that impact medical professionals and patients. Hospital congestion can cause inefficiencies in wait time and healthcare administration, as well as exposing people to an environment contaminated by other patients. In emergency situations, the time between the incident and the intervention of a doctor is critical. People in rural areas with limited access to healthcare often face long transportation times to be diagnosed and administered to by a doctor. What if there was a solution to these problems? We have developed a device solely designed to solve these problems by combining necessary equipment into a compact, easy to use, and versatile toolbox. This device consists of a main hub which connects to different medical tools like the EKG, the pulse sensor, and stethoscope, all compacted together for maximized portability. Costing just around $100, this device has the ability to add more devices, making it a medical version of a Swiss army knife. Hospital congestion should be reduced and patient exposure to other contaminated patients should be minimized. In emergency situations, medical professionals should have the access to diagnostic metrics with the patients before they arrive to the hospital. Doctors should be more prepared in emergency situations where moments matter. Consumers should be able to uh, metrics, and um, we can help that become a reality with our product. So, for the need statement of our project is, we have to come up with the design of a product that incorporates several medical instruments such as uh, ECG health monitoring system, stethoscope, and pulse oximetry into a single unit that will be able to collect, record, 
and share real-time data with the health professionals that can make decisions based on patient health data, as well as allow empower people to share their health data with medical professionals remotely and get consultations, which will allow them to reduce their medical visits into hospitals. It will also increase the accessibility of health professionals to rural areas where there is limitation of medically trained health professionals. The requirements of our project was that our device needs to be, first of all, portable, such that it's incorporating three different medical equipment into one single unit. Secondly, it needs to be cost effective, such that it's cheaper than the products that are already available in the market. Third, it needs to be adaptable, such that not only these three instruments, but like many other instruments can be hooked up to it and can be used using a rechargeable battery. And fourth, it needs to be able to collect accurate real-time data. And fifth, it needs to be able to share the data with the health professionals over Wi-Fi. Handing over to Jacob, he'll be talking about the existing products and our design. So I want to speak about the, yeah, the existing products and our design and how much they cost separately. Because there are um, mobile products out there that can do this function. So if you're going to be getting your portable EKG, that will probably run you $450. Your electronic stethoscope will cost you more than $210. And the electronic uh, pulse oximeter can cost more than $50, all separate. Now, our design will incorporate all of that into one easy to use system. And it can have real time data sharing. It can be customizable. The needs of different populations will require different instrumentation. Some people may need more training or may have more training or, or may have less training. And we can customize um, instrumentations tailored to different people. It needs to be portable so that anybody can use it anywhere. And it needs to be able to monitor all uh, metrics simultaneously so that the doctor or, who, or the physician can see everything going on uh, at the, simultaneously. Um, we have working uh, footage of our prototype. Stefan here is, we are currently getting his EKG reading right here with this uh, working prototype that we have. And then this next one is a pulse uh, meter that just measures his pulse. This is all used at the same time, or, or within a uh, very short time, and on the same device. Now, handing over to, now that we've showed you what it does, maybe we can now show you how it can affect day-to-day -day life. Thank you. I would like to first state that our product, OPEX, is not a device, in fact. It's like, it's a complete package. I would like to explain you how it's a complete package, because. Um, we've got some uh, products like uh, the Echo Duo and stuff, who have, uh, which have already incorporated or um, uh, mixed ECG and even the pulse oximetry part into a single device. But our device OPEX uh, like stands off because it does not only uh, it creates room of opportunity for other other vitals also to be scanned. For example, the EEG and etc. to be connected to the same platform and readings be taken. It's, it's nothing like, uh, it's something similar to a DSLR camera where you could uh, change your lenses as per your uh, requirement. And you could even get, the, get multiple uh, vital uh, data at the same time. So uh, our, uh, the in-transit health monitoring is, uh, has been a, a major uh, like part where we uh, kind of concentrate because the golden hour period where the trauma, at, uh, the time at which the trauma takes place and the time where he is admitted into the hospital is very important. So with this uh, information being uh, transferred wirelessly to the doctor or the physician at the emergency ward would prove very helpful. And home diagnostics which could uh, uh, like read the vitals and keep continuous evaluation 
and with the oncoming big data analytics uh, algorithms, we could even uh, get uh, predict diseases that could be, uh, be prevented. And uh, the decreased health, health cost, like uh, to the cost that uh, taken for uh, uh, undergoing such tests would be decreased. And the telemedicine, where the uh, people from rural areas could get access to such health services using our device. Um, in the future, what we would like to do with uh, our device is to make it, first of all, smaller. Um, this is pretty small in itself. Um, even though we have been using uh, evaluation kits, but we can make it much smaller. And another thing that we can do is uh, make this wireless. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we would also like to introduce a training application for professionals to use this device because it is a very user-friendly uh, device and uh, it is very compatible to uh, a large, uh, a lot of people. Um, so in conclusion, here's what we present to you. We have a cost-effective and portable device. Now this can be used for preventative and emergency medicine. And it helps uh, doctors get remote access to people in remote locations. And given the resources, we believe that this can revolutionize the portable medical uh, device industry. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? So, am I to understand that is this the device that it would probably look like? That, yes, that's a mock-up. Yes, okay. Future. Is this the supposed future. to be like a hub where you can just plug in all these different units and they're yes. interchangeable? Yes. 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 And you would uh, then have software built in that would yes. basically recognize the device because maybe peop there would be a third market, a third-party market yes. for the attachments. Yeah. Um, okay, good. I just wanted to understand exactly how it was supposed to work. Uh, how do you visualize the signal? Sorry? How do you look into the signal? Because you don't have screens or anything. That thing. How are you planning to look uh, into the This, uh, how we're planning to go about this is, uh, uh, this is connected currently to a computer. And on the computer, we have an application which uh, acquires the digital data and uh, shows the signals. But we are planning to make it wireless as well in the future. For uh, home purposes, like uh, for uh, real-time data, we could even get, uh, we've already got these health variables that are common, have become common, like the Fitbits and stuff. We could integrate it with a smartwatch where we could uh, uh, get the real-time uh, data vitals on it. Would like to, I'd like to make a statement like uh, this uh, device is not only concentrated to a particular personal like only for the uh, first responders and stuff. It is it caters uh, to the needs of a much wider community which includes first responders, uh, the doctor, uh, physicians. First responders, the physicians and mainly the people uh, general populace who are who don't have access to the regular healthcare services yes okay thank you very much
Welcome back. Uh, we are going to go into the second half of the presentations, and we're going to hear now from RX Assistant. All right. Howdy. We are RX Dot Assistant. My name is Amanda. I'm a biomedical engineer here at Texas A&M. I'm Harshit. I'm a mechanical engineering student at IIT India. I'm Reese. I'm a senior electrical engineering student at Texas A&M. I'm John Wright. I'm a senior industrial engineer from Texas A&M. Hi, I am Saurabh Akhrawala. My major is mechanical engineering. I am from India. I am Rishikesh, mechanical engineering from India. Hey Alexa. Okay Google. Cortana. Hey Siri. Watson. Okay Google. Hey Siri. Alexa. Cortana. Cortana. Okay, Google. Hey Cortana. Okay, Google. Alexa. Improve healthcare. Hello. I am an Rx dot assistant, but you can call me Roxy. Currently, doctor to patient interaction is severely lacking. Most of the doctor's time is devoted to transcription and filling in medical records. Medical scribes and transcription software are utilized, but they are costly, lack functionality, and inaccurate. It was horrible. And the voice understanding recognition, like, it would have been better for me to, like, talk to my phone as a text message and put it, you know, transfer yeah. that to, like, my email. Doctor visits are impersonal and frustrating for both the patient and physician. To improve doctor to patient relations, a transcription service that is smart enough to integrate with current medical record platforms needs to be created. It would be so helpful for it to be automatically slaved into. That would be huge. The service needs to successfully utilize a database of up-to-date medical terminology. Most importantly, the service needs to relieve the physician of simple tasks that normally take patient interaction time. Honestly, most patients would prefer to be looking someone in the eye than have their doctor staring in a different direction, you know, filling out the, the computer as they talk to them. I think that's generally a universal thing that people yeah, have electronic about. records at this point. By combining functionalities of current technology and making my physical appearance compact, I can make patient care more about the patient. Alright, so the problem that we've been tasked with is the uh, age-old problem of doctors, not really age-old, but very, very recent problem of doctors spending way too much time behind their computers. This reduces uh, patient uh, care time and as well as uh, patient satisfaction. Uh, Dr. Flores gave us a statistic earlier uh, this weekend. Uh, during a regular 20 minute examination, uh, patient examination, a uh, doctor will typically spend 16 minutes of those 20 minutes uh, behind the computer, not even looking at the patient. So here's a list of um, features that we'd like to include in our, in our product. First and foremost, we need speech-to-text transcription of the entire doctor's visit, and we'd like to also use natural language processing to extract keywords, um, medical terms, and then categorize those. We'd also like to integrate this with existing um, file systems. For instance, Epic is a very large one, very well used. We'd also like to have this um, very minimal training for the doctors, very simple to use, um, like it to be small, and we'd also like to have the option for the patient or the doctor to pause and resume the transcription whenever they like. So where rx.assistant comes into play uh, is with these features, these key features. Um, first and foremost, it's going to be a, uh, as we said, a uh, audio to text dictation service. There's plenty of those out there, but ours goes a little bit beyond that. It's going to be able to analyze keywords that a doctor will say. Uh, it'll show up, uh, throw up a cue on their screen that they can actually view uh, in real time. It's going to be able to connect to uh, current EHR systems in place uh, in different facilities. It's also going to be able to communicate with doctors and patients to uh, facilitate, facilitate a more transparent uh, uh, interaction. Uh, it's obviously going to be a huge support to doctors and I think most importantly it's going to be a very secure uh, network. Coming toward the designing and fabrication part, we actually had two designs in our mind. The first one was cuboidal and the second one was hemisphere. Uh, in our first design, we actually used four major equipments, Raspberry Pi, microphone, LED, and breadboard. 
so basically in this case the microphone the microphone was hanging out of the setup and was in direct contact with the surroundings or air uh, due to this there may be a possibility that uh, there may be a uh, disturbance in the recording of the uh, command given to the prototype also there was uh, very much space left vacant in the design which can actually affect the cost so with a view to overcome these problems we actually tried to uh, give it a uh, hemispherical or dome kind of shape uh, in this prototype the microphone would be uh, placed inside and uh, for the proper functioning and recording we can actually drill holes on the surface of the hemisphere also the led will be put at the top of the dome so that it is clearly visible from long distances here we have a rudimentary version of our speech recognition there are a lot of different services out there and most of them are cloud-based. So this is what we plan to use as a wireless or an internet access speech recognition service, for instance, Google Speech API. Or you could also use Amazon Alexa or IBM Watson. <coughs> they all have their own versions. And so we want to be able to trans or sync this transcription with the medical filing system so the physician can say have an iPad and they could view this transcription in real time and insert their own comments. We also like this record to be available to the patient um, after the visit through a financial, or sorry, through the EHR um, portal. And on top of this, we'd also like to be able to use some of these keywords that we'd recognize to generate some electronic prescriptions, which after the visit would be reviewed by the physician so that they can make sure that all of the, all the transcriptions were correct before sending it on to the pharmacy. Okay, the text file we get here will have unsorted data, which will be not very useful. So we want, we want to process that. For that, we'll be using an API called MetaMap. What it, do, what, is do, what it does is that it passes the uh, sentence, categorizes each biological term, and uh, creates a sorted data TXT file. It uses a UMLS, which is a language system uh, which manages all this. So after we get the sorted data, it will be uploaded on the database of hospital which uh, can be viewed by doctors and all the employees of the hospital. Here's an example, expected outcome. So you can see the sorted data. Every event is underlined with a green, and every medical term is associated with a color, which can be sign, test, disease, or something like that. Here we also have a list of competitors. Um, the medical field is always going to be a very com a competitive industry just because there's a lot of money in it. So you have something like SmartMD that can be looking up some of these terms while you're doing it. Um, Dragon Assistant has their own version of um, checking some of this medical transcription. But one of the differences is this would be um, not a discrete device. It would be an app or something like that um, on a computer so that the physician would be needing to check this and have this in the foreground of something that they were running. Um, ours would be discrete. It would be in the corner. You could access it by a few voice commands. But other than that, it would essentially be out of mind. So our basic business model that we have uh, <coughs> provided, uh, we can go ahead and start with uh, basic timeline and demographic target. So to tap into the healthcare uh, market, uh, I think a good place to start would be uh, very specialized physicians. Uh, Brett even mentioned going into dentistry, which was very interesting. Uh, uh, market right there. They're very uh, uh, low risk, uh, high technology uh, field. There's a lot of different similar specialized markets like that. Uh, from there, we'd like to uh, introduce rollout packages to similar medical fields. And then the, the sort of breakout moment would be uh, to tap into hospital networks or even par a partnership with a uh, major EHR. Uh, we would like to provide a subscription service where we provide free hardware, similar to like a direct TV setup, where you get the free hardware and you pay monthly for a subscription uh, of the service and the 24-7 uh, assistance. And, yeah. yeah. Coming towards the numbers and figures, we have found out that the final cost of this prototype is around $44 which includes uh, le other electronics like the Raspberry Pi, like uh, connecting wires, and the manufacturing process like casting and uh, molding. And uh, uh, 3D printing, uh, especially 3D printing is not uh, at all feasible for this process because it takes time and costly also. Laser cutting can be used because it's a kind of a similar, yeah. and, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, 
the uh, yearly overhead is around 350000 dollar and uh, we are taking we are assuming that it will take around 5 uh, years at least to, to make a profit which will, which will be around 70000 dollar and uh, other manufacturers are there like healthcare uh, which is a 1.7 billion <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so um, I, I would just want to comment that uh, you kind of talked about doing some diagnostics and stuff. I would say keep it simple. Just keep it so simple. The big problem, which you identified in the beginning, is the doctor looking at the computer screen the whole time and never looking at the patient. That's just such a big problem that if all you do is solve that, you're going to have a huge uptake in this thing. So don't, don't worry about getting into the, the other stuff in the beginning. And in this, you are able to annotate the things you need and additional EMRs. You can build on top of that an EMR. Perhaps we can talk about it a little bit more. Okay. Were there any considerations about, uh, there's almost a different vocabulary between different type of medical professions, of how uh, the, um, the, the UMLS could translate that differently or hear something differently, but it sounds very similar in different medical professions. That's where uh, we kind of delved into with the business uh, model that I proposed. Uh, if we started with a certain, uh, I guess, medical language, as in a certain special specialization, from there, we can kind of get our foot in the, the healthcare industry, like the, the healthcare door there. Uh, and then we try to introduce rollout packages for different specializations, uh, more in-depth programming, different languages, different ways that, that uh, our service would be able to adapt to the different fields. Howdy everyone, we are Pop Incorporated and this is the Pill Organization Provider. My name is Kedar Balakrishna and I'm a senior here at Texas A&M studying Biomedical Engineering. Hi everyone, my name is Chris. I go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and I'm a junior studying Biomedical Engineering. Howdy, my name is Grady Burnett and I'm a senior Biomedical Engineer here at Texas A&M. My name is Caleb, I am a senior at Clemson University in Biomedical Engineering. Hi, my name is Kevin Campbell. I am also a senior going here to Texas A&M University. I am a mechanical engineering student. Hello guys, my name is Anora Ramir. I am also attending Texas A&M University. I'm a junior mechanical engineering major, also pursuing a minor in biomedical engineering. And this Imagine if this was your grandpa. You'd want to do everything in your power to prevent it. Elderly people want to live independently. However, prescription medications make this difficult. Not sticking to these regimens by forgetting to take medication or accidentally taking too much can cause serious health problems resulting in hospitalization or even in the worst case, death. Although there are current solutions on the market, they are either too simple, leading to poor management of medications, or too expensive and too complicated for elders to use. 
However, our solution, the medication station, provides an intuitive combination of technology and simplicity. By using a novel alarm system, the elderly are more likely to follow their prescription regimens. Combined with our secure software and database, it works alongside physicians, enabling them to better monitor their patients' medication usage. It allows them to alter pill prescriptions to more effectively manage disease treatment. POP Incorporated. Life is complicated enough. Taking prescription medications shouldn't be. Alright, for our needs statement, we wanted to focus on how most elderly Americans want to live independently for as long as possible. However, there are some barriers to living by yourself, such as depression, medication mismanagement, a greater risk of falling, and lack of help in an emergency. When we developed our project outcomes, we wanted to focus on specifically medication management and how it relates to, the, to several other of, the, of these factors. Yeah, so what we first did is we went and we talked to elderly individuals, see what problems they were experiencing with taking their medications, and see what problems other individuals and their friends were having with taking these medications. From there, we went on and we did some secondary market research, see what problems other companies have had, how they've solved it, while also doing literature reviews as what doctors and medical staff have deemed to be the problems. And the biggest problem that we realized was reduced clinical non-adherence. That is the most important thing that we have to do. For those of you who don't know what uh, clinical non-adherence is, it's when a doctor gives you a prescription regimen and you don't adhere to it or you don't follow it step by step. One of the reasons that why we identify that is in an elderly individuals, there's a lot of confusions about these. They're taking a lot of different drugs. They have to remember, oh, it's 10 o'clock and I have to take this prescription, this many pills. So we wanted to be able to simplify that and then we also wanted to, because of that, reduce unintentional overdosing, so accidentally taking more than one at a time. So then leading on, 55% of the elderly are non-compliant -compli with their prescription drug orders. That means over half of the population isn't following the recommendations of what their doctor gives them. And that leads to over 200,000 adults are hospitalized due to this. And on the lower end, $100 billion in cost to the US healthcare system, or at the upper end, $289 billion. Furthermore, on top of that, we run into the issue where other symptoms such as depression are being able to be mediated through medical non-adherence and taking that away will be able to better treat it. So based on our project objectives and our stakeholder interviews, we found that the most important design requirement for such a device would be that it accommodates the elderly. And we broke that down into it being very robust in design, being simple, easy to use for the elderly, uh, having a simple user interface, being relatively cheap, and most importantly, providing a very intuitive patient provider system that's very easy to use on the elder's end. Uh, so for the design process, when we started off designing this device, it began as a very complicated device. We wanted it to accomplish every goal in its sum. We wanted it to be a pill sorter, uh, automatically dispense pills. We wanted to cut pills if they were segmented pills. Uh, but we found that these overcomplicated devices, they gave it too large a margin for error and it needed to be simplified. So what we came up with was the medication station. So a lot of work has gone into designing the medication station, um, a lot of complex work, and the result is a device that is incredibly simple to use. So uh, to load the device, a patient would just take a bottle of pills and scan the prescription barcode, and the device would then light up a compartment to load all of those pills into, so they're all stored in one place. Then when it was time to take that particular medication, an alarm on the medication station sounds and a light lights up in the compartment with the pill that they should take. And on the top there's a display which displays the number of those pills that the patient should take at that given time. Uh, if the patient takes that prescription earlier, then it will note that down and not have them take another dose. And if they take it late, it will also log that for the doctor to see. Or if they miss it altogether, that will also be logged in the database that the doctor will be able to view. Um, if the doctor needs to change the dosage for the patient, then they will log into their online portal and change it there. And it will sync directly with the device uh, via the internet. Now I'd like to reiterate that over 200,000 patients, elderly, are hospitalized annually because of this medication issue. Um, and so it is easy to see that uh, 
the hospitalization of these patients is a very big issue. Now, what our solution aims to do, what our software aims to do, is it creates an intuitive interface that allows for the doctors, the physicians, the clinicians, the caretakers of these elderly patients to be able to see the different medications, the times, the different medica medical specifications that they might need to help them manage this medication process. And so what this, uh, what this site is able to do is it's able to connect to our device using a special 256K encrypted security software that allows it to uh, then uh, have a customized medical regimen for the patient themselves. Now to illustrate this example, I'm going to be using uh, an example. Consider uh, Adam Smith, a patient. He sets up an appointment with Dr. Avent, his physician. So before the appointment, Dr. Avent can log on to our software. He can see uh, the, his list of patients. He'll click on Adam Smith, the desired patient. And then he can see the list of medications, the list of times that uh, Adam Smith has taken these medications, the start date, the end date, and all the specific details he needs to set up a, an effective conclusion on the practices of Adam Smith. And so, um, you know, using the software, he is able to then uh, set up a effective regimen and um, allow for this device to function properly. So looking at our market, we kind of did some digging to see what's already, what's already out there. And on, on one end of the market, there's very low cost solutions with no technology. Those are like pill dispensers you can buy at Walmart. And on the other side, there's these complicated devices being developed that are $1,000 and they let you fully automate the process, but the technology that's present, is, it's great, but it's, it's not great for elderly people. I, I, they don't know what button to press, how to use the touch screen. And so we've developed a middle of the road solution. So because we don't have too much technology, our price points in the middle of the road, as well as our technology, still gets the benefits for the clinician and, and the families and the accountability that it provides, but it, it doesn't confuse the elderly patient. It's not too complicated. And so there's, there's three main points. The doctors and families can get some oversight on the patient taking pills. The dosage can be changed kind of on the spot. And then on, on something that's great is if this person goes to a different doctor, they could look on their portal and have all their medication history rather than having to write it all down. And, and that would reduce some medical errors of going somewhere prescribing a drug that happens to interact with something that's not supposed to. So uh, bringing it all back together, the medication station overall improves the quality of life for elderly individuals. It's a comprehensive middle market solution and it increases data-driven medical care. Thank you and thank you to all of our mentors and we'll field any questions you have at this time. Very much. Was there any consideration to using the existing pill bottles as the container for this as well, so that uh, there's a barcode printed on it, it, it's already available, there would be no need to, to just take it and dump it out, but rather connect it and roll it in and it's there? Uh, yeah, so there was thought of doing that. The reason we didn't, um, was because of just the varying size of pill bottles. And so that didn't seem like a very elegant solution in the end, um, but it was, it was looked into. Um, and that was the reason we decided against that was just, there was the existing issue with medical, uh, our, our pill prescription sizes. Right, it was just too much variation in the pill size of bottles. How do you, how are you sure that the patient took the pill? Oh, so of course, to an extent that's gonna be on the patient if they wanna throw it over their shoulder, you can't stop them. So what it would have um, is that each lid has a sensor to tell that they opened the right compartment when the light went off and they were told to take it. And so it would register that they have actually opened the right compartment However, of course, them actually taking that pill would be up to the patient, of course, yes. 
to uh, further address that, um, we have our display also provide instructions. So it would remind them to bring water because sometimes what happens is when elderly people take pills, they'll get the pills, set them aside, and go get, get the water, but then forget that they're going to actually take the pills. So we'll have the instructions on our display for everything that they need to do before taking the pills. Well, what's neat about this, though, is there's two solutions going on here. One is the physical solution of taking the pills. And if you can actually get that portal working properly, then the over overdosing of opiates and stuff like that, where people go prescription shopping, you could actually minimize that or avoid it altogether. So so there's there's two solutions here that you're you're dealing with. Did you consider a locking mechanism also to make it, you know, childproof? But then also, it could be only that compartment can be open at, at a particular time. Yes, <laughs> we were uh, thinking about including that in future iterations, or we would have a lock which you can attach onto it when grandkids or whatnot come over to the grandparents' house. Okay, one more. All right, perfect. Did you test the ergonomics and putting two fingers within those little compartments? <laughs> yeah, so another, another thing that we were hoping to add, um, but is not yet on this prototype, was to have uh, a smaller, like more of like a shakeout style to, get, to make it easier to get one pill in and out of it um, and to improve the ergonomics, but that's not integrated yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Next team is PediaWare. You are there? Yes, sir. Parents expect to go to full term and deliver their baby and have their baby in the room with them. You go in thinking you're going to be able to have all this time bonding with your baby and instead you have this chaotic, crazy few months. Half a million children are admitted to the NICU each year. I didn't see her for the first three days because I actually went up to ICU. And I kept asking the nurses, is my baby going to die? Is she going to die? Is she going to die? It just all seemed like a bad dream and I was waiting to wake up from it. If we could awaken parents from their NICU nightmares, would you support us? Anxious parents fail to retain information beyond the first few words. What if we had an app to increase awareness and retention of NICU knowledge? That's where PediaWare comes in. We have designed an app to educate and inform parents of their newborn status, complete with personalized educational videos, live feed incubator streaming, and an interface to connect with your child's clinical team. With your support, we can revolutionize the neonatal intensive care unit educational process so that parents can sleep easy knowing their children are secure. So unfortunately, I, I hope uh, I can connect with you all in the sense that you've probably all been in a moment where you've been asked to make a decision, but not known all of the details you need to make that decision in an informed manner. And uh, unfortunately, the reality is that a lot of people experience that in the NICU. Um, and it's incredibly difficult, obviously. And we're here today to, to look towards how we can better educate parents such that they can make those tough decisions in a way that they feel is, is most informed for them. 
And in the process of doing that, we, we've considered five very important design requirements. First, that it's easy to access this solution. So for us, that means that it's in the palm of your hand. That it's simple in the sense that patients can intuitively access information and not feel like they have to get through a series of hoops to really understand what kind of information they want to get. Uh, also that it's trustworthy and modifiable to the point where patients feel like this is a, a very personalized solution and I'm really excited for us to share with you guys how we've managed to make this solution a personal one. And lastly, and quite obviously, that it's hospital compliant in the sense that it's both NICU compatible and also complies with HIPAA regulations. Currently, there is a wealth of information resources out there in various forms, in app form, in guidebook form. However, as we look through them, there's kind of a constant theme that goes through each of them. There's too much text, there's too much technical language, and in a state of high anxiety, parents are not going to be able to parse that, and they're not going to be able to absorb that. Heck, they're probably not even going to be able to look through that. And so, as a result of that, we have conceived three separate design options so far. The first one is a was a bit of on the simple side, a mobile slash web app that mimicked WebMD but looked for a more simpler, more digestible feed of information. However, this lacks the personal touch what we believe are really is going to engage patient awareness. Secondly, we went for a high-tech option wherein we would design a full immersive and virtual VR NICU experience in order to both provide a anxiety reducing connection uh, with the parent and their child, but also provide an interactive and immersive learning environment to redirect their awareness and provide them up further educational resources in that virtual environment. However, we believe this is too expensive and too technically stringent uh, for us to currently realize. So the third design option fell in the Goldilocks zone between those first two. We're looking at developing a uh, EHR integrated app which will help the patients, um, help the parents connect better with their patients which are staying in the NICU. The immersive environment that you get with VR, we're uh, emulating that with uh, headphones and a tablet screen, which would be given to the mother uh, upon entry into the uh, recovery area after labor and delivery. So the physicians are already entering information about the condition and the status of the uh, NICU or the neonate which is in the NICU uh, as they are needing to update their, their computerized order entry. So the app can connect to any of these EHR systems which have open APIs and can pull the information as they are available uh, as the physicians are updating the information and transfer that to the app to the patient to the parents room and deliver the parents a truly immersive or uh, semi-immersive uh, environment um, such that they can gain the educational uh, knowledge that they need about what their baby is going through and how they will need to follow up with the care of their baby at home. So we'd like to run a quick live demo for you of our application. <coughs> so imagine, if you will, that the mother has just been handed a device from birth of their child child has been moved to the NICU. And so the nurse is currently trying to explain to the mother what is going on with their child, why they are doing what they are. And so on this app, the mother has immediate access to a video which gives her a comprehensive overview of the procedure. This video also has relevant links on the side which allow her access to see what some of the surgical techniques that are being used and also what are some of the procedures that she can expect as a follow-up. After viewing this app, the mother also has access to a clinical team link this link will allow her to speak with the clinical team through video and or chat. Uh, this link also provides her access to the clinical team in a list format and uh, the names of the clinical team including the nurses and the surgeons. Lastly, the mother has access to live and secure audio feed of the child or video feed of the child uh, in the incubator. Uh, the child will be uh, monitored uh, in the incubator through audio and visual. The mother can also speak to the child through a uh, microphone. Uh, capability, and the mother uh, can also take pictures of the video feed of the child uh, through the app. Ultimately, we aim to use this application to uh, improve uh, retention and the reduction of anxiety. Now, we took this app, we took this interface, and we went uh, 
out to seek some validation. We took it to emergency rooms and, and uh, got in the hands of some nurses and also former mothers that had been in the NICU environment in order to go beyond the need statement and see, is there a need for this? Do they like this? Do they want this? And the result was far better than what we had expected. They had, they were really excited about this. They understood the, the fear and shock that they would be in and saw value in this. And uh, however, beyond the patient value, which we were able to discover more about, we were able to find potentially a uh, cost opportunity that would allow us to engage with hospitals. One thing that we have discovered that uh, constantly came up when addressing issues of, re of patient education is uh, the cost of readmission that that can generate for poor patient education once they're going out home and they're out of the hospital environment. In particular, with uh, uh, the NICU environment, uh, for readmission in the NICU or ER environments, there's all sorts of very preventable conditions that can stem from stuff such as jaundice, feeding problems, uh, and septic conditions that all stem back to uh, preventable causes that could be prevented with better patient education. And it's estimated that these hospital, that each individual hospital is losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just through NICU readmissions. And uh, we wanted to thank you for the um, time that you've spent listening to us so far. We hope that uh, with some of our basic proofs of concept that we've been able to demonstrate uh, some of the innovation and ability to engage patients and personalize their experience. Ultimately, while we've done some preliminary engagement of end users and in in healthcare professionals, we want, really want to be able to take the opportunity to develop our technology further, actually get the personalization up and functioning, and really start to engage local hospitals and, and hopefully get to a point of engaging in a NICU pilot trial. And uh, with that, we'd like to thank you for your time and ask you if you have any questions. So for someone that can speak from experience and, and dealing with this, um, would this device be issued by the, the, the hospital to the, to the parents in order to control it or would it be something, a, a, an application? That's the market that we're trying to reach is the hospital uh, care providers, and they would be our uh, primary go-to for uh, marketing potential. Um, so we would hope that they would uh, purchase the products, have the uh, iPads and uh, headsets available, um, but it's really a follow-home device as well. You can um, load the same app on a phone, and it works just the same. And as, and as far as the, um, the interaction with the, uh, the, the doctor, the medical team, is that something that could also have been recorded? Because, you know, the, the doctor's hours vary versus the, the, the parent's hours, um, um, something that could be interactive but still recorded to, get, you know, to receive later in True. response. The, the interactive messaging feature that we have could uh, theoretically include that uh, component as well. I'd also love to add in the interim that, um, as Julie mentioned, a really great feature of this is that while there is some, some requirement in the hospital to have a tablet to initially give to that mother in the, in the room prior or post giving birth, there is complete capacity for parents to download this app. And in the situation where you know you're going to have a premature baby, you as a father or the mother, even uh, in the well enough state, can download this app onto your phone prior to giving birth. It's not necessarily a, a post birth uh, necessity situation that you are prepared well enough and in most cases for the queue uh, I believe that in most premature cases you do have the opportunity beforehand to really start to prepare for that challenge okay any other questions all right thank you all very much <laughs> next team is safe bite
at the very edge. Judge, you all ready? Okay, go right ahead. Howdy, good afternoon. My name is Charles Norton. Adelaide. Tom Nan. Dorian. Ted Lord John. And we are Safe Bike. Before we get into improving food safety, we need to start talking about everyone's favorite thing, food. There is a tradition as old as time. It's about gathering around a table and coming together. About how food makes families and builds communities. And about how the simple meal continues one of the world's oldest traditions. This is about how food affects us all and why it is made with such care. Why it is prepared with safe practices and why it is crafted with love. This is why food is prepared to keep harmful bacteria out but keep flavor in and made to keep sickness at bay while letting us grow strong. This is about the importance of food safety which starts from the simple wash of one's hand and continues with the technologies of tomorrow. It reflects our traditional approach to washing our dishes and suggests how designing new solutions may help prevent future diseases. This is about a lot of things, but this is not just about improving food safety. This is about alleviating a mother's worries about her child's meal and about that child who one day wants to play in the big leagues. This is about stopping one in six Americans from eating contaminated food every year and making sure that a father doesn't miss his son's graduation. This is about a dream vacation to a paradise beyond, while eliminating the risk of contracting a foodborne disease. So what if we could quickly and accurately test a different deadly bacteria? What if there was a device which protects you before your first bite? We have the solution, and our device protects you and your family's health as allows a food inspector today to protect you tomorrow. So our solution is the food one. It's a handheld portable device that allows you to easily detect bacteria in food. It is very simple to use, it's very cost effective, and it's not invasive to the food. So we're, we don't need to destroy the food to test it. Our initial designs was the um, inspector one, which is a downgraded version of this. It is a device you attach to your phone and insert into, a food, uh, into food to detect whether there is pathogens in it or not. Our second device was a utensil that you, uh, you integrate a food strip onto your utensil to detect for pathogens. And our third device was a food testing kit connected to your phone. You are using well plates to uh, detect pathogens within a small sample of food. We chose the inspector one and we built on it and now we have the food one. So this is our final prototype. As you can see, the tip, the back, and the pusher are 3D printed and the body is aluminum. We added a uh, a food strip to the center onto the pusher and you can adjust the distance of the food strip. I'll tell you why that's important next. So while testing it, we would extrude a small section of the food strip outwards and we would use this extruded section to contact the food. Uh, after we've contacted the food, we would place a small dab of solution on here. It would illuminate the strip and thus we would determine whether or not there were pathogens on the strip. Uh, we would use an imaging sensor to detect whether or not there were. Uh, pathogens or not. Um, and uh, another novelty of this strip is that it's segmented. So instead of just using one strip per food item, 
we can uh, use one strip for multiple food items by using one section of the food strip each, so they're all isolated from each other, you can then test multiple food items that way. This, is, this device is similar to a pregnancy test kit, but pregnancy test kits are one-time only deals, while well, you can use one strip for multiple food items. And we also integrated this with uh, mobile integration. So you can plug in a USB and plug it into your laptop or to your phone uh, through an adapter. And in that way, it would, you would have a very simple interface, very simple interface to look at. Now, uh, we, will, we will go into present the biological mechanism uh, without insult to uh, this device. So it's very easy to understand. It's just an interaction between uh, antibody and uh, antigen. And in your case, this antigen is, uh, for example, the toxin uh, for the bacteria, but we can also uh, find the virus like, uh, like the norovirus. So, um, we, we want also to um, apply this interaction, and for this, uh, we use an easy uh, mechanism. It's a color latex, latex, and uh, the latex in biotechnology is uh, usually uh, a common uh, process. So uh, for your device, it's very interesting because we can change the color uh, according to the different pattern. <coughs> And uh, it's very easy to interpret with the uh, electronic device because it's color, it's different color. Uh, in our final concept, we could have five different uh, stripes, strips, uh, but um, we can uh, detect uh, for each pathogen on each uh, strip, and uh, the pathogen includes a bacteria, virus, or different chemicals. For our presentation, uh, uh, we can uh, we can imagine that we have only uh, two different cases as illustrated on this uh, slide. So on the left strip, uh, we have a specific antibody to detect, uh, for example, the uh, norovirus antigen. Uh, so uh, in addition, this antibody is, uh, is uh, conjugated with a colored latex, uh, with, uh, as we can see uh, on this slide with the, the blue circle. Uh, so basically, uh, if we have a food contamination by a norovirus, uh, we, uh, when the device will be in contact with the food solution, so uh, the pathogen uh, will be strongly and specifically uh, linked with uh, the antibody, and all the complex uh, will uh, will uh, migrate, will diffuse by capillarity until the test time here, and uh, the color reaction uh, due to the uh, latex aggregation could be easily uh, captured by electronic device included in in the in the device. Contrary to the norovirus, sorry, uh, we can also uh, apply the absence of pathogen thanks to uh, the negative control uh, in the white of the device. So it's another strip, but uh, like you can see, this strip is specific of the salmonella and, uh, and bacteria. And um, like you can see, if we have absence of uh, toxin uh, spe specific to the salmonella, the antibody um, continue the migration until the last line, so it is the control, it is a negative control line. So while researching about the traditional detectable method, we found several problems. One is that it takes too long to process your data, and the other one was that it's kind of expensive. So on the other hand, we're going to offer something that's very cheap and that's also extremely fast. So our food one will have an estimated cost of $50 and will only take two minutes to process your data. So we have a wide range of market who will be interested in our product because they need to provide big food. And also according to USDA, the United States, United States spends more than $15.6 billion every year with food for illness. If given more time and resources, we would like to add this functionality. We really like the Bluetooth idea because then we won't need the wire anymore and it's going to move more freely. In conclusion, we're confident that our product will reduce economic loss, revolutionize food process, and save countless lives. Thank you. Judges, questions? Okay.
So do these strips exist now, or do you have to invent them, create them? The, the type of strips that we need are, may not be created right now, but through R&D we could create them. But um, the general concept of the strip has already been created through like pregnancy tests and other tests. I'm sure we do have strips right now that can uh, test for E. coli or ver many common pathogens. I don't know if anybody knows if they do or not. <laughs> So uh, food strips do exist currently. They're usually uh, used in the food industry to check for chemical-based uh, forms and pH. That's true. Yep. Everybody's done like a pH test in like lab, right? And so currently these are very much um, so single use only. So you take your your strip, you tuck it in a water, generally a sanitary solution, and you get a very very hard to interpret result out of it. So the novelness of this solution is that you can test for multiple things on one strip instead of only being able to test for, like just pH. dictated the length of your prototype? I designed it. I tried to design it around a pen so it would fit around your hand easily, but you could make it much smaller or much bigger depending on the size of the strip that you would want. So you're not actually detecting the bacteria. You're detecting, detecting secondary uh, chemicals caused by the bacteria, I'm assuming. We can detect uh, particle toxin from the bacteria, but we can also detect uh, virus because of small uh, it is a small size. It depends on the antibody that we can find, and uh, it depends also on the pathogen, <coughs> if it's, it's a virus, virus or something like this. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs> the next team is GLS Insight. We are GLS Insights. My name is Kendrick Lim, and I'm a junior biomedical engineering student here at Texas A&M. My name is Charlie Arnold. I am a junior mechanical engineering student at Texas A&M. Hi, I'm uh, Krushi Patel. I'm a junior aerospace engineering student at Ohio State University. Hi, my name is Emma Foster. I am going to be a senior in biological engineering at Purdue University. And I'm Jordan Brito. I'm a chemical engineer junior at Texas A&M University. Our team was tasked with developing a non-invasive method of measuring serum electrolytes and substances. Next, we'll show you a video of what exactly we've been up to. Muscle cramps, tiredness, fatigue, symptoms of low sodium, low glucose, and high lactate. GLS can help. The leg wearable measures lactate and sodium, while the glove measures glucose levels. Get real-time information with Bluetooth and Ant Plus compatibility.
get insights into your body. Get GLS. So today we'll cover our background, uh, information like behind the product and why we designed this. Next we'll cover the design requirements, the design alternatives, as well as the solutions and each um, component of it. And lastly, we'll discuss the specialty of our device and why it's unique to the market. All right, so um, like Hendrik said earlier, we were asked to design a device that would measure different levels of substances in the body non-invasively. Um, currently, glucose, lactic acid, and different levels of electrolytes are most commonly measured through blood tests. And the risk um, associated with blood tests are pain and the risk of infection. Um, Getting these results back is um, uh, not a quick turnaround. It's usually about a day to get to get lab the results from um, doctors' offices, and it's time-consuming to actually go get these blood tests done. In the process of designing our uh, device, we have five requirements that we thought about. First off, non-invasive. As Emma said, blood tests, the traditional blood tests that uh, provide these, this information about the electrolyte, uh, come with a high risk of infection. Secondly, it has to be very user friendly. You know, not it's not always expected to be, um, to be used by the doctor. Someone with less medical experience could use it as well, and we want to make it to where it's compatible with everybody. Um, of course, we want accurate results from the product. We also want real time readings. By this, we mean that a lot of blood tests nowadays take a couple days, you know, at least to get the result back. Um, with our device, it'll come back in five minutes, maybe um, at most. And lastly, we want it to be portable, so you don't have to use it at a hospital or in the household or even near like an outlet. So going through our um, different iterations of design, uh, we looked at an orally ingested pill type sensor device, um, but we, uh, going through our design requirements, we figured this isn't uh, very user friendly and it might not have um, very accurate results depending on if you've just eaten or um, there could be other factors that um, make the <coughs> results variable. Um, the next iteration we looked at a doing a type of urine test, but again, that's not very user friendly. And um, again, there's no real time feedback for that scenario. Then we were looking into finger sensor type devices that already exist, like a pulse oximeter, and maybe modi modifying something like that to be able to um, measure the substances we're interested in. And in looking into that idea, we realized we were not able to get all of our uh, substance requirements in one device alone. So we're deciding on a multi-device kit system. As you can see, there are many individual solutions to all of our needs, but there's not one solution that covers all of our needs. So we took a step back and we were like, you know, who really needs a product, you know? We're, we're looking into the lactic acid, the glucose and the sodium uh, concentrations in your body. So we're thinking, you know, who really needs it? We uh, came to the conclusion that it was the high endurance athletes and essentially this meant that we would need a very portable, lightweight device that they can use maybe in training or in game to detect, detect their nutrient levels in the body. So what we came up with prototypes, um, we have a band that will go around your arm or your leg, um, very simple, but the idea with this is that it'll detect your lactic acid levels as well as your sodium levels. Um, we'll explain how it does this in a little bit. Our other device is a glove, it's a very just simple device, but it's a glove with a glucose uh, sensor and it just attaches to your finger in the glove and it detects when your glucose levels are high or low and then it uh, informs you. Do we think that these uh, devices meet our requirements? Yes, we do. Very portable, um, very user friendly because it'll just pop up with the results and you just need no numbers or maybe it'll even tell you like you need to uh, eat more sodium, take more salts. Um, it's also very uh, real time, like it gives you a real time results. It doesn't take too long at all uh, compared to the blood tests. Glucose measurements are very important to our target audience because they reflect the food energy level. And they're especially important to diabetic athletes who frequently need to take uh, blood sugar levels. So this technology uses a range of radio waves from about 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz. And it goes through a thin piece of skin and two sensors measure the impedance. Um, since it needs a thin piece of skin, we're putting it in the fingertip of the glove. And this technology is very new. Um, companies like MetaWise, they're creating the GlucoWise development. 
and it's not released yet. It's very new technology. Uh, so when you're exercising, carbohydrates break down into energy and lactic acid. And lactic acid is that burning sensation you get in your legs. It impedes muscle function. And in a 2015 study, they were able to find a correlation between lactic acid and physiological tremors. Uh, the way they detected this was by shooting a laser at the muscle and then reading the data back with a camera. In this way, they were able to correlate the lactic acid and muscle tremors. From that, they were able to detect lactic acid in a non-invasive way. Uh, so the sodium, when you work, when, when you work out and uh, when, fit, when your body releases sweat, it has all the electrodes in it, like sodium, potassium, chloride. And uh, we, were, we figured out that we can measure uh, concentration of sodium in your sweat. So the, we, we need to use ion sensitive membrane, which basically let pass through only sodium uh, through the membrane and that will generate potential and we'll have electrodes there to measure the voltage and that can relate to the concentration of the sodium in your body. Uh, the picture that shows that's the prototype that we made uh, is Arduino at the breadboard and we tested with three different solutions, one Gatorade, one 50% Gatorade, 50% water, and one purified water. Uh, the reason for that was Gatorade mimics uh, the amount of so concentration of sodium we have in our body. And the 50% Gatorade, 50% water is when you worked out really hard and you, you need more salt. And the purified water is about when you're going to pass out. Probably you already passed out at that point. <laughs> uh, so this is how it works. You basically put two electrodes into the solution. Uh, it gets the value of the voltage, and we convert that to con concentration of the sodium, and in display shows a concentration of sodium is this much, and you're good to go or go to a doctor. So the current products that we're competing against on the market are mostly heart rate monitors and power meters for bicycles. Now, heart rate is, uh, it has limitations because it changes all the time. Based on what you ate for breakfast that morning, uh, what your age is, it's too variable to get an accurate reading of what your body is doing. And then power meters, they're a little bit better, but they only measure mechanical power. So that doesn't really give you a good physiological marker as to maybe how hard it is to keep that power. So the benefits of GLS, or glucose, lactate, and uh, so sodium, <laughs> sorry, uh, are that it gives you an all-round picture of what's going on in your body when you're exercising. So if you can get a picture of that, you can understand how hard you can go, whether or not you can make it up that climb, whether or not you can hang with a group. Uh, and the benefit of our system is that we bring multiple solutions together. Yes, we have two devices, but we have two systems in one device. Most devices can only detect one right now, and they're, uh, they're bulky, and it's kind of, you have to have a lot of things. So the more you can compress, the better. So in short summary, you can train harder, you can train smarter, and you can train more efficiently with GLS. Judges, questions? Well, the only comment I would make is some of those hard training sports like soccer, you're not allowed to wear jewelry or anything hard, so you'd have to figure out a way to put it out of contact. Uh, baseball, you know, they won't let you wear watches and stuff like that, so I, I don't know how you would work around that. In, in our idea, I guess, um, what we're thinking more is like, is for, for training during the purpose of training, because you can wear whatever you want in that. Um, of course, in-game, there are many restrictions, you can't wear bracelets, etc. cetera. Um, so maybe like during the timeouts, because there's no way to really wear anything in a game. Um, when you're going to be sweating, it's not like you're going to have a lack of sweat in a performance game. So maybe in the timeouts, during your uh, huddles, you check your pulse, you know, or at halftime, really. Because even if you're out like for a timeout, that, that'll get enough time to really completely replenish. So halftime is ideally where you would check your nutrients again and fill all back up. Is there anything about uh, the level of these nutrients um, before a game starts that tell you that you are well prepared and ready to go? So maybe uh, could your device be used to check these nutrients like before a cross country race or something like that? Something that's gonna last 15, 16, 20 minutes, but uh, gives you an idea about, oh, I, I need to you know, eat another you know, granola bars. Awesome. So ideally, you would be using this device in your training, and you would kind of have more insight into yourself and how your body functions. You could get baseline readings on um, how you're metabolizing your glucose, or how 
much sodium you're losing as you're working out. So you can have that baseline knowledge of what you would need to start out with so that you're at your peak performance at the end of that 5K or at the end of your race. I think you can also figure out like peak performance or lactic acid when it's at peak and when can you, but at, I think at that time you're doing your most. Uh, so you can figure that out by training and you'll know uh, what will be your lactic uh, acid reading when you are at your peak performance. So I think you can use that to to probably try get more granola bars or get something else or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next team, the last in the session, is Hexaform. And I, my name is Austin Liu, and I am also a senior biomedical engineering major. My name is Richa Patel, and I'm a junior biomedical engineering major at Texas A&M. My name is Shannon Ingram, and I'm a senior biomedical engineering student at Texas A&M. Melissa Chavez, and I'm a mechanical engineering student at West Texas A&M. We're Hexaform, and we have uh, a video to present to you. Around 6.3 million fractures happen every year in the United States. These fractures vary from children to adults, from arms to legs to entire bodies. Commonly, there are two types of casts used when you break a bone. There are fiberglass casts and there are plaster casts. With these casts, patients experience discomfort and other similar effects such as being too itchy, too big, too smelly, too tight, causing bacterial infections, difficulties moving fingers or toes, and causing pressure sores, numbness, and pain in the affected limbs. Because of these problems, there is a need for a low-cost, mechanically robust, comfortable, and most importantly, waterproof cast that allows for skin visibility. At Hexaform, we have risen to the challenge of developing a versatile cast that can withstand water and other environmental factors that can prevent irritation to patients without surrounding practicality. We've got your six. As the video mentioned, 6.3 million fractures will occur each year in the U.S. alone. 300,000 of those fractures are what, we, what, what is called Coley's fracture, which is just a plain wrist fracture. Uh, and this encompasses 16% of all musculoskeletal injuries in the U.S. The, cur the current solutions for uh, a fracture include a joint splint, braces, uh, cast, and surgery, with cast being the most commonly used. And now Austin will talk to you about the problem that we're trying to tackle. Of the casts, there are two commonly used ones. There are plaster casts and fiberglass casts. These casts have been used for over decades and have barely changed. Uh, these two share very common um, negative effects, which are irritation to the skin, a bad odor, and can also take a while to set and can be harmful to the bone if not set correctly. These are examples of what the cast can do to your arm at the moment. So while looking at the design problems, we thought we would do, or we would um, have the project objective of developing a waterproof cast that will allow full bone healing and visualization of the injury site. 
So when looking at that project objective, we thought we'd get the design requirements of waterproof, mechanical robust, comfortable, and allows for visualization of healing, and cost effective. Currently, there are waterproof covers, 3D printed casts, uh, uh, molded casts, and uh, waterproof fiber, fiberglass casts. But they have lots of problems, uh, some, some of which are they are very expensive, they are very uncomfortable, and they are very un impractical. Shannon will talk to you more about our design, uh, alternative designs. While we were brainstorming ways to approach this problem, we come, came up with a couple of different ideas. So the first was to develop an inflatable cast that would be strengthened with a, hardened, uh, with a hard outer casing. And the second was to optimize the current 3D pre printed mesh casts to be more cost effective. And the third was to implement a stretchable mesh cast that could conform to the patient's limb and then be hardened in place. Uh, out of the three of these, we ended up going with the 3D printed mesh cast optimized to be more cost effective. Throughout, the, the, throughout our design process, the idea of a 3D printed mesh cast evolved into an injection molded mesh cast. And this was so we can avoid the complexities of personalized medicine by implementing an impact gel that can conform to various sizes of limbs, which enables mass production and ultimately lowers costs. So Melissa is going to go into detail about our design. Thank you, Shannon. So Hexaform is, com is, a, com is a three layer cast. It is comprised of 100% uh, polyester, and this allows for skin protection, breathability, as well as rapid drying. The second layer consists of, a, of an impact gel. This gel is called Div Gel. What this does is it adds protection as well as comfort. The outermost layer, it, it's a it is a polypropylene, and this is to, to make a rigid structure, but also allows for easily molding. The reason we chose this design was to add, to add this mechanically robust, robust um, honeycomb design, and this would allow to, to easily customize as well as add these attachments. Now, as most of you know, anytime you break a bone, you do lose muscle mass. In order to avoid having to recast, we do have these adjustable ties, and then that would also be cost effective. And Austin's gonna pass around the dip gel. Not only is our, is our product durable, but it's also very cost effective. Just to produce or manufacture one unit, it costs under $6. This would mean the initial startup would easily, would easily be paid off after 2,000 units. This would mean in, for, in order to be profitable, we would only have to sell 3,000 in order to make $93,000. If we hit 10% of our market, we would, we would at that point have a profit of $2 million. Having a profit of $2 million, we could easily incorporate, um, we could easily incorporate cutting edge technology such as the BOA, which is a tightening, tightening device. Also, the 3D printing, would, which would add custom, customization. And then also we would add the antimicrobial coating. And then it would also reduce uh, infections as well as increase the, um, increase the durability of our casting. And now we're gonna open it up for questions. Go. So looking at this cast, looking at the, the gel, mm -hmm. it's, it's universal designs here, not custom for the, the patient, or are there options? Correct. So this will come in four different sizes. Um, it will be uh, small, medium, large, and extra large, but the straps will adjust, and therefore it will allow for, uh, to conform a little bit better to the arm. And to elaborate on that, so the sizes will be based off of primarily your radius of curvature right here, which is pretty consistent of your arm. But one of the reasons we chose this honeycomb structure is so that if you needed to, you could clip parts of it out. So if you're like the wrist is narrower than further up the arm or something like that, you could clip it down and then still have plenty of places to put the straps. So that's customizable? Yes. Okay. 
there's one important thing, and it's a cool thing about a cast, and that's getting it drawn on in signatures. <laughs> <laughs> we can add that to our future okay. development. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to, the judges and I are going to retire into uh, the room and we'll come back and announce the winners. For those of you who are here, uh, y'all will kind of uh, hang around a bit because we want to make sure that we get everybody together. We're going to move all the chairs and tables away and we're going to get a group shot up here at the very last uh, after the award ceremony and then uh, everybody will get a chance to to return all the stuff that you've had in the, in the stock room and then come back. I really want to say that these presentations that we've seen today are incredibly impressive. What you have accomplished in 48 hours is truly amazing. I hope you take this as a spark to get you going, to continue designing, to continue to work on these projects, and continue to move forward. We, for those of you who are Texas A&M University students, we will help you here. For those of you who are not Texas A&M University students, I'm your ally. I will help and work with you however you possibly can in your university to connect you with whatever we can help you connect with. Congratulations on what you have accomplished. Congratulations on how far you push these ideas. It is truly impressive. We will be back in a few minutes with the unfortunate task of having to select a winner.
Clint, where are you? Okay, it was, uh, we've been using scoring software and um, the scoring software allowed us to choose things very quickly. I'm, don't, please do not under, do, please do not believe that because the score, we got back so quickly that it was easy to make a choice. It wasn't. The scores were incredibly close, but nonetheless, uh, we were able to at least complete it fairly quickly. All right, so the judges were so impressed that they forced me into awarding an honorable mention as well. All right, so we've got uh, four awards. The honorable mention team will get $250. And again, I want to tell you, I want anybody who wants to continue on, please come back and work with us. We'll help you. I have, I have both grant money to continue to fund prototypes and I have an NSF program called an i Sites program that will help lead you through customer discovery. We've got $2,500 per team to be able to provide you with travel funds to go visit and, and do customers. It also gives you NSF funding heritage that allows you to apply for a $50,000 grant. All right, so that is an NSF iSite i program uh, we'll start it again in the fall, and then we'll do another one in the spring. So there's all kinds of opportunities for you to continue on with your work. Outstanding work. All right, so I don't have a check for the honorable mention, folks, but nonetheless, um, and, and by the way, I have checks for the other ones. They're not cashable. All right. <laughs> so you can come and uh, get the checks, take your pictures and things like that, but I want the checks back, please. <laughs> All right, so for an honorable mention, and the reason that this is an honorable mention is because the judges really want to see you continue to pursue this, it is TBI Solutions. Y'all come up forward, come up here. Get, get center. Congratulations. And now for our third place award. Third place award is uh, $500. It goes to Pop Incorporated. Form. continue to pursue your entrepreneurial spirit. And however we can help you do that, please get in touch with us and we will continue to work with you. The first place team is Team Bakers.
chance to get a little bit of sleep tonight, because I know you didn't get very much last night. Please consider coming back and working with us again. We love having you. We're a great group. Please, everybody, come forward. Let's do a quick group shot, and then we'll all leave. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.